we have uh i'm really excited about this guest because i got to act opposite him quite a bit on the sopranos some of my favorite stuff uh as christopher was opposite our guest today very successful actor and producer was born in manhattan began his acting career on the stage with his parents and sister at age seven Played Joe Hackett in 172 episodes of Wings, was the voice of Superman in the animated series, has appeared in over 100 films and TV series, including Diner, Justice League Do, Madam Secretary, Private Practice, From the Earth to the Moon, Grey's Anatomy. He is a political activist and in 2012 actually climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and appeared in four episodes of The Sopranos as screenwriter J.T. Dolan. Please welcome Tim Daly. There he is. Hey, here I am. Hey, hey guys. Doing, pal? Hi, gentlemen. Good Thanks to for see you, me. man. Thank you for doing this. We really appreciate it a lot. Are you yes, in sir. Manhattan? Where are you now? No, I'm actually on Cape Cod at my, my accomplice's house. I would call her my girlfriend, but at my age, it sounds kind of corny. So <laughs> you're like, we're partners in crime. I call her my accomplice. Nice. Uh, now, you started acting at seven years old or before that? Well, that's actually that's actually kind of a false press story. Ah, okay. My dad was doing this play in Summerstock with my mother and my sister Tyne, who had a real part, and my sister Glenn, who had a real part. And the publicity people at the, uh, the Bucks County Playhouse thought, wouldn't it be cute if we threw Tim in there or something? So... They took liberty, which is probably illegal, and wrote me a part, a one-line part. I said something like, hi, father, or two, two lines, hi, father, bye, father. I think my father played a priest. And I was just this little shit. I didn't care at all. I, I was just, I would go back by the river outside the playhouse and throw rocks. I would always miss the curtain call because I was out running around outside um, with, with, this buddy, <laughs> with this buddy of mine. So I don't really consider that the start of my career. Um, I, so how, I, how, how old were you when you started? Well, I sort of count, I, I actually sort of count Diner as the start of my career because after Diner, I didn't have to do another job to feed myself. Gotcha. Uh, so I think it was two days after my 25th birthday, which is pretty wow. good. Thank you. That's great. And, and before that, you were you like studying acting, auditioning, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, I went to, I went to, well, I actually went to Syracuse University for about eight days. And then I quit without telling my parents, which was kind of a mistake. Um, but I, <laughs> and I traveled around for a couple of years doing all kinds of blue collar stuff. And, and I realized that my brain was kind of ossifying. So I went back to college. I went to this kind of hippie school in Vermont called Bennington College. And I did a lot of theater. And then, um, you know, when I graduated, I went to New York and started auditioning and just, uh, you know, I was working construction, actually, um, a little construction company, this friend of mine. And, you know, it was, it was funny days because we were, you know, actors are very resourceful um, a lot of times. So we didn't have any money. Right. But we would hit all these happy hours all over town. We knew where the best happy hours were so we could feed ourselves. You know, we'd order like the cheapest beer. We dust ourselves off and then we fill ourselves up on like pigs and blankets and mini egg rolls and like <laughs> slabs of cheese. But we were the with the better class of people, right? Like these hoity toities. But that's how we how we'd have dinner with for no practically no money. Uh, and then I got lucky, you know. I got I got diner and and um, you know I've been working ever since. Diner was you know is a classic movie. It's Barry Levinson and. The cast was Mickey Great Rourke, cast. Incredible. Kevin Bacon, uh, yourself, Steve, Steve, Steve Gutenberg, Gutenberg, Ellen Barkin. Uh, Ellen Barkin. Was Tim Matheson in that as well? No. 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 Who's it? Kevin is Bacon. Brother? Kevin said, Bacon yeah. and uh, Riser, uh, Daniel Riser? Stern. Daniel Paul Stern. Riser. Andy that's Stern. Right. And Andy Stern. Yeah, that's a great Great, cast. great, and, great. I just saw it not long ago. Great movie, Barry Levinson. So you obviously you auditioned. Did you have to audition for that over and over or yeah, like seven times. Seven times. Yeah, I mean, they just made, they put me through hell. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of those deals where, actually, the story is kind of funny because um, at the time, my sister Tyne, who, as you know, is a very well-known actress, was not well-known. And she was in some kind of, sounds like a real goopy sort of poetry, women's poetry reading group that they would do on Sunday mornings. 
um, that I thought was drippy. But she was friends with Valerie Curtin, who was married to Barry at the time. And Tyne said, what's Barry doing? And he said, oh, he's making his movie, you know, about his childhood in Baltimore. And, and Tyne said, well, you should see my kid brother. He's, you know, poking around New York. He's got nothing to do. So uh, Tyne called me up and said, call your agent about it. So I called my agent. They said, nah, you're not right for it. I said, oh, OK. So I called Tyne. I said, they said, I'm not right for it. The time called Valerie and Valerie called Barry. And so they did me a favor and they're like, OK, we'll see. And I went to see uh, Ellen Chenoweth, who's turned out to be one of the great cast. Great, directors. great, great. And we see Ellen and she said, well, you're not really right for it. You're too young. But, you know, what the hell? We'll let you read for Barry. So I read for Barry and he loved me. And I was like, oh, this is weird. And then so like seven times and, and a screen test later, I find I think they had offered it to a lot of people. Um, and everybody turned it down because for whatever reason, they didn't get it. Uh, but uh, I, I was so thrilled to do it and, and you know, made a lot of friends and and had a really wonderful I time. I mean, all of you guys became stars. I mean, yeah. every single one of you. It's amazing. Was it Barry's first movie? It was Barry's first movie. Wow. Yeah. And I'll never forget the first day. I was in the first day of shooting her, shooting this pool hall. And um, uh so, you know, it's the typical wind up to shooting, you know, the, the you know, they say quiet, please. And they they um, get the slate out and they say, you know, scene, you know, 23, take one mark. And they do the clapper like that. And then there's silence. And I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And I hear the first assistant director whisper to Barry, you got to say action. And he goes, action. And everybody just cracked up. We just fell out. He didn't he was so into it. He didn't know what to do. Dude, next. that is hilarious. <laughs> That's really funny. But it was a great experience for you as a as an actor and as a young man. You know, it was being around those actors and around Barry. That was it imagine. was. You know, I mean, I felt um, I never in a million years imagined that I would do film or television. I thought I was going to be a theater actor, as you know, Michael. I did a play at your theater. That's right. Um, and so I was kind of I was pretty terrified. Uh, uh, and, you know, I often when I see Diner, I look back and I go, oh, man, that is a scared young man. It kind of worked for the part. But um, I would you know, it's one of those things. I'd love to go back and play that part again now. It's like, you know, when I was in when I was in college, I played Romeo and Romeo and Juliet. And I was the perfect age, but I didn't understand. the part. I understand right. Romeo much better now than I did. Right. When I was the right age. Uh, so I'd love to go back and do it again. But that ain't going to happen. But you have to go through those things, right? You have to go through being terrified in front of the camera because there's, it's just part of the thing. You just have, at some point, you just have to do it. You could be in class forever, but at some point, you got to just trial by fire. Yeah. You know, the thing is, and the, the thing that's weird is that I grew, up, I grew up in a family of fucking actors. You know, right. it's like we would sit around the dinner table. My father would be talking about Shakespeare and Ibsen and Shaw and Chekhov. Nobody told me that I had to have a headshot. <laughs> Nobody told me I had to type out a rat. Nobody told me any of the like practical shit. And I remember after diner, like when I got to diner, like my first few days, they were getting frustrated with me because I didn't know that you had to stand on a mark. I don't know if the public knows this, but, you know, they put down a piece of tape on the floor. You got to walk in and you got to hit that mark or you're out of focus. I didn't know you had to do that. So, yeah. um, so what I would do is I was so freaked out by it. I would walk around on sidewalks and you know, the expansion joints and sidewalks, I would see one like four, four, you know, things away. And I would try to look up and see how close I could get to it without looking down. Right. Um, but <laughs> I, was, yeah. I just did not want to be out of focus. Anymore. And now after Dinah, uh, Tim, after Dinah, did a lot of work come your way? That, that that had to open a lot of doors, you know. Or it it did open some doors, and you know, unfortunately, um, I I was I don't think I was I wasn't arrogant as a young man, but I was um, I was kind of overly optimistic. I thought I did this movie Diner, and this is my artistic watermark below which I will not fall. Well, that was a stupid fucking thing to think. Because you sound like Michael. You very rarely. <laughs> you very rarely reach an artistic level like diner, you know? So I, I actually turned down a lot of stuff that I wish I had done uh, because uh, it may not have been the artistic level of diner, but it would have given me some more opportunities in the movies, especially. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I still, from time to time, 
someone remembers Diner uh, enough to think that I might be the right guy for a part and whatever. So uh, it's got me a lot of work. No, but I understand that. You know, like, um, I mean, I did Goodfellas very early in my career and kind of thought that was just the start of that kind of material with those kind of people. And that wasn't the case necessarily. I mean, there were plenty of good stuff similar, you know, but a lot of stuff that nowhere near that mark, you know what I mean? And it was, you kind of have to get used to, okay, it's not going to always be like this. But what else? I mean, The Sopranos was the first TV show I ever did. So yeah, I well, started out doing the shittiest of shit. <laughs> <laughs> the shittiest of shit. I yeah. dressed in the back of a van, uh, America's Funniest People, <laughs> Sunday Comics, all this garbage, little sketches, two lines, bullshit stuff. You know, but that's where I learned how to hit my mark. That's where I learned all the technical shit, where the camera is, that when I finally got to a real set, I knew what to do. You know, it was no. all that garbage stuff. You know, they, you know, in acting class, they don't necessarily teach you about hitting your mark and stuff like that. No. You know, uh, the practical stuff of acting that you need to know, you know. No, the first yeah. time I was in front of a camera, I didn't know where to look. Like the camera's there and I'm like, I really was so thrown because I had no idea where to look. Not obviously not in the camera, but well, right. listen. The yeah. second thing I did with Lenny Clark, he's a comedian. I looked right in the camera, and they kept it <laughs> right in the camera. <laughs> so this is funny. I I left this out because I did do between between that seven year old stint of that you know fake part that I did, and uh, when I started my career after college, I did do one thing with my father. My father did this thing on PBS American Playhouse. It was a uh, a film version of this play, this Ibsen play called Enemy of the People. And mm. they and they had this kid playing his son who was just a little shit. He didn't know his lines. He was throwing paper airplanes in the middle of rehearsal, driving everybody crazy. So my dad said, well, my kid's about the right age. How about you audition him? And so I, I didn't know what I didn't know what was happening. Anyway, they hired me for this part. And there was this scene where um, I was uh, kneeling down by this kind of ottoman with this kid that played my brother and we're supposed to be looking at a, a picture album and the shot is between us right so we're here and the camera's looking between us and twice um during that scene because there's really folks in the background i just went like this i just went <laughs> i look right in the camera <laughs> like that and they left it they didn't have the budget to go back and re yeah. <laughs> oh man so now yeah you, you do 172 episodes of wings which was an iconic sitcom, completely different than what you were used to. Different rhythm, acting in a sitcom as opposed to diner, et cetera. Yeah. How'd that go? Did you enjoy that? You know, I I loved it. I really loved it. I wish that I had loved it a little more because, again, you know, um, I, I had I mean, d doing a series for a long, I mean, you guys know you did Sopranos for a long time. So after a while, it's like you love it, but you start going crazy. It's like what the, like you just doing the same part and it's the same kind of, you know, um, feeling on, on the set. And, and, you, and you start to think I need to do something else. Like, so I'll tell you a story about, about Jimmy Gandolfini. It's, you know, cause I remember him from the set and he was, uh, you know, he was so kind of immersed in that role and, and it was so, dark and i felt that he was kind of um you know somewhat conflicted about it because he was kind of getting all this attention and all this adulation for playing a you know murderous sociopath which is kind of a weird you know head trip i think sure. anyway i saw him uh in that play that he did on broadway um oh crap help me with the gods name. of carnage gods of carnage and he was so fucking funny. And I went backstage afterwards because I didn't know Jimmy well. I went back to just tell him how great I thought he was. And, you know, I, I thought that, you know, I'd say, hey, Jimmy, you were just great. Great to see you. We'd spend a couple minutes and leave. He invited me into the dressing room. My daughter was with me. And we spent almost an hour. I was like looking at my watch. like, geez, Jimmy, I got to go to bed. He was so happy and so, like, relieved of the weight of, yeah. of the Sopranos and and so for me, it was kind of the opposite. Like when I was doing wings, I was looking for something deep and dark because it was all very light and fluffy. Now it was great fluff, but it was, you know, it was that kind of um, 
in the, in that sweet spot of comedy, which never goes to the the other edges of the human experience. Yeah, he was very happy doing that play. You know, I remember when I we we went together, Steve. Yeah. And he said to me, "I feel like a real actor again." That's what he mm. said backstage that night. <laughs> which well, he, he was very hard on himself. Really hard on himself. Yeah. I mean, you know, it took him. I'd say. A solid two years from being Tony Soprano to finally get all that shit out of him. His attitude was different. He felt better about himself. It took a couple of years at least, you know, and yeah. to like regroup, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, right. Because it know. wasn't just about the work. It was, there was also this whole other level of like, you know, cultural phenomenon and right. celebrity yeah, yeah. That, that really, that, I think that's really what he meant, you know, where he felt the theater, it was every night, it was just about the play, really. And he could really just settle in. And, and um, he was very happy doing that. I know it was, you know, that cast was just stellar. Yeah. Was, it, was it Marsha yeah. Gay Harden and uh, Jeff Daniels? Jeff Daniels, yeah. And was it Hope? Uh, Hope Davis. Hope Davis, just four heavyweights. Yeah, amazing. Phenomenal. Um, you worked with David Chase before The Sopranos. I did. So yeah, the first time I met David, this is this is a funny story. Um, I he was uh, he had a deal at Universal, and he was directing uh, his first directing job. He was directing a remake of this um, of Alfred Hitchcock Presents because Alfred Hitchcock late in his career did these. I think half hour standalone, you know, it's like a um, serialized thing. Like a Twilight yeah. zone kind of thing. Yeah, right? like a Twilight Zone. Exactly. Well, he used to introduce it, right? Yeah. yeah. Hitchcock. So, so I, I go in to read for this thing. Uh, it was called Enough Rope for Two. I remember that. And I, I do my reading and I say, thank you very much. David was there. I go out, I close the door and I look at the assistant who's sitting behind a desk and I hold up the script and I say, well, that's one job I don't have to worry about getting. And I threw the script in the wastebasket. <laughs> By the time I got home, I'd been offered the job. I was like, what? But why'd and you say that? Why'd you think you didn't get it? Because I looked at David and he, the look on his face gives was you like, nothing. someone That's just it. killed my entire family. <laughs> that was my experience. That was the look on his face. I was like, he hates me so much. And so, and it's funny because, <laughs> so I did that. And then um, a few years later, I did this fantastic series that David created with um, uh, uh, um, what's his name, Connor, um, Larry, yeah, Connor. Larry Connor, Larry. who wrote the movie Many Saints, yeah. and Robin Green was on that. Yeah, and Robin and it was Green this show also. called Almost Grown that was kind of like an act. I mean, it was a dream for me because I played between age seventeen and age forty in any given episode. So these three time periods, one is like. Um, you know, 1968, 1975, and then present day, which was late 80s. So there's makeup and cars and costumes. It was just awesome. And it was a brilliant show. And it was on CBS, which at the time was like, you know, it's a, a network. They didn't know what the hell they had paid their money to do. But um, anyway, I was talking to Dave and I said, I thought you hated me so much. And he said, this is the story of my life. He said, this, I mean, you know, there's the I don't know if you're allowed to say this anymore, but there's the resting bitch face. I mean, if you look, if you put that in the dictionary, you would have a picture of David <laughs> like that is the face. No, you know? I had the same experience. But now that that first thing you did with him, the, the Alfred Hitchcock, did that air? Was that did that have a season? It, it did. I mean, he was one episode of that season. Oh, one. He only did one. He just did one. Yeah. He wasn't like the host or anything. It was just one episode. And he wrote and directed. Yeah, he, yeah. He, I mean, they were scripts from Alfred Hitchcock Presents, but they were reworked for modern day. Yeah, modern exactly. day. And how long did you run on um, Almost Grown? Uh, just 13 episodes. We did yeah. a pilot. We got picked up. And it was actually one of those weird situations where we were shooting the 12th episode and they came down and said we were canceled. So we had to do another episode after we knew that it was gone. It was yeah. very odd. but. Yeah. I would love to see that again. I'd love to see that, you know, uh, find a, a life someplace on a streamer so we could see if it holds up. So so let me ask you, uh, Tim. So how long after Almost Grown ends and then you hear from David again? Ten years? Uh, oh, geez. Probably 10 or 15, maybe 15 years. But, I mean, we had, we had kept in touch a little bit. But, you know, the first thing that happened was 
David called me up and invited me to come see the pilot of The Sopranos, which was at this screening room. I think it was at MGM. And so talk about being hard on yourself. So I go and I see that, you know, it's, it's on a big screen and I see this pilot and I'm just gobsmacked. I'm like, what was that, man? That was so fucking great. I've never seen anything like this. You know, the ducks in the pool. And I just, I mean, I was floored by how great it was. And I came outside and said, David, man, that's amazing. I was, yeah, man, I don't know. And a fucking CBS passed on, you know, those assholes. God damn it. I mean, that's, you know, fucking HBO. And because back then HBO was like, you yeah. know, they had boxing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and Not he that. thought he was it was going to go down the tubes in some place that would never see the light of day. And I said, "Dude, just you just just wait, just give this a little a little shot." And then, you know, the rest is history. It took off um, like crazy. And then I think every season after that, he would call me and he would say, "Hey, do you want to come do a part on on Sopranos?" And I would say, "Hell yeah." And I said, what is it? And he would say, well, it's this guy who blah, blah, blah. And he would start and he would say like, nah, and he would talk himself out of it mid conversation. I'd be like, wait, David, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so, so finally he called me up and he said, I wrote you part. I said, great. I don't even care. I'll just do it. And this is, this is how, how funny David is. So I get this script and the guy's name is TJ Dolan. Right. And that's almost my initials. It's TJ Dolan, and he's from, uh, I forget, you know, like someplace in New Jersey. And then um, I, you know, I get pages with, you know, di different colored pages, and he's changed the name to JT Dolan. And I realized that he remembered that my real name, my legal name is James Timothy Daly, not Timothy James Daly. So he literally put out different pages so that my initials would line up. And then he puts out other pages because he knew that I grew up in a town called Suffern, New York, which is essentially the same town as Mawa, New Jersey. There's just a train tracks that go through. So we changed the name of the town where I was from to Mawa. Um, and I thought this, this cocksucker is just, you know, he's just, yeah. just finding everything out he can about me and using it in the show. But um, it worked out really well. And it was, it was fun to be his kind of um, inner uh demon you know the, the right. tv writer <laughs> who only has an emmy he doesn't have an oscar you know? right. <laughs> all this stuff uh so he found a way to beat himself up publicly with, through me and the tv industry i guess too yeah at the same yeah. time and well uh, the 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 stuff between you and uh, you work mostly with michael almost exclusively yeah. right yeah. i mean there was some really funny stuff some great Sad stuff, great stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. When you were talking at the Writers Guild and you're talking to all the writers and and the, uh, ben, I think it's uh, Benny and Murma come in and they hit you with the fucking book. <laughs> they just drag you out. <laughs> I mean, they hit me with it. Well, Michael, well, you hit me with the uh, Humanitas Award, right? And right. They hit me oh, with a laptop good. and they <laughs> beat the, the shit Humanitas out. Award. <laughs> yeah, Humanitas Award. Yeah. Humanitas. Um, yeah, we had, we had a good time. I mean, that, 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 the stuff was so juicy. You know, it's a gangster who wants to be a writer, who wants to write movies or TV and, and a TV writer, but they connect on the level of being dope addicts trying to be recovering dope at it. I mean, all those ingredients, it's just so, there's so much to play. There was always so much to play, you know. It was yeah, just, it was really, it was Until really it amazing. got really, you know, really dark when, you know, Christopher just flat out kills you basically in cold blood. There, just boom, yeah, but, you know. Uh, you know, I was thinking about that. And I think that, you know, JT just said the magic words, you know, he says, Chris, you're in the mafia. And that's like, you know, a non that's like game over. You can't say that, you know. And, and it was game over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and another great scene when you were explaining to all the guys about Cleaver. That Hilarious. is a brilliant scene. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah. yeah um, I, I will admit now that I, I stole a bunch of props uh, from the set, like, you know, a cleaver, oh, what do you have? sweatshirt and cleaver coffee <laughs> mugs and stuff like that that were, um, yeah, don't tell the prop guys. That stuff is very valuable now, Tim. Collector's item. 
It certainly is. <laughs> um, do you have a, a favorite scene that you remember that from doing? Was it one moment where you really felt, oh, this really? Because he was a dark guy. I mean, it, there's a lot yeah. of funny shit, but he's he had a lot of demons. Uh, yeah, I mean, he that, transferred that, his dope addiction to a gambling addiction. Gambling. I mean, you know, it, it's hard to say a, a, a great moment. I mean, there were so many great moments, you know. Um, you know, like when you the the thing where you take my car and you say, right. I said, I love this car. You know, it's just so, so funny and pathetic. And the scene where I'm doped up, I'm in the pawn shop and, and I'm trying to pawn my Emmy. And I'm like, this, this is like huge, this shit. And the guy said, yes, yeah, not an Oscar. I mean, that was hilarious. But I think if I had to pick, you know, I think it was that scene where you kill me because that was like a big, juicy scene yeah. you know, where you had a lot going on and I had a lot going on. And obviously it didn't end well for poor JT, but uh, that was just, that, that was, I think my favorite scene. Tell me, uh, tell me about climbing Kilimanjaro. So this is, I mean, this is a, just a weird story. So um, I had, I had been doing this show called uh, private practice that wasn't, wasn't the pinnacle of my career. I wasn't a very happy camper over there. And so they wrote me off the show and which I was, I, I would have been fine with, except it didn't, it, it, the way it happened wasn't very uh, pleasant. It should have been, it should, I, you know, I, they should have been more upfront about it. And I'm a big boy. I can handle this. Anyway. So I'm, I'm bummed out. I'm depressed sitting around in LA, which is not a good place to be if you're unemployed actor. And so this friend of mine calls me up and he goes, Hey, you want to climb my Kilimanjaro? I said, sure. When he goes 10 days. I said, all right, I'm not a climber, I'm not a camper. But so the next day, this is, I can't make this up. I'm lying in bed and I'm watching TV and I'm trying to crack my big toe. My big toe feels jammed and I pull it really hard. I'm like, ah, this thing won't crack. And I wake up in the morning and I walk across the room I'm like, ow, what the hell? I go to the doctor. I had broken my own toe. I literally with my hand broken my own big toe. And I said, I'm supposed to climb Mount Kilimanjaro in a week. The doctor says, well, it's going to hurt. I said, yeah, well, it's only every other step. So um anyway so i you know i'm like fuck it i'm gonna i'm just gonna do it and i but i promised myself that if i made it to the summit that i was gonna have an epiphany like all my all my self-pity about being unemployed blah blah i was gonna go away there were gonna be brass bands and lightning bolts and it was gonna be like the skies would open and i'd know the meaning of life so long story short I, I do this thing, you know, like 25% of the people don't make it. And I'm, I'm there at like almost 20,000 feet. Everybody's pissed off at me because I haven't done any training. And I'm like, fine, the altitude doesn't bother me. That's just luck. And so I'm waiting for my epiphany. Nothing, like no brass bands, no lightning bolts, no orgasms. It's just that. So then I'm trudging down, right? Because it's like you get up in the middle of the night, you walk up 5,000 feet, and then you spend a couple hours there, then you go down 10,000 feet. So I'm trudging down this mountain. I'm like, God damn it, no epiphany. And then suddenly I have my epiphany, right? Which is like none of, none of the fancy stuff. It's like a fucking bumper sticker. It's so mundane. and the, But the message is it's all in the journey, right? It's like you never arrive any place. You got to keep going. You know, wake up in the morning, you do the yeah. dishes, you got to do them again tomorrow. You just, it's like, I was like, okay, I get it. Don't, you know, just keep, keep going. Things will change. So, yeah, uh, that but, makes a lot of sense. I mean, what, how long did it take to like do the climb? Like, uh, I think the whole thing is six days. That's amazing. That six you didn't days. train at all and you're climbing this shit. It's did amazing. you use oxygen? No, no, no oxygen. And how no. high is Kilimanjaro? It's it's uh, almost twenty thousand feet. Wow! Yeah, it's wow. high. That's pretty um, amazing. It, That's- it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. And my, and my buddy, who had trained for five months and looked like a freaking Greek statue, you know, he was just like ripped and everything. The poor guy, whatever his genetic makeup is, he was like on oxygen. He couldn't carry his own pack, and he Jeez. he forced himself to get to the summit. But then he got home and he was in bed for like you know, a month trying to recover. So why some people are just more sensitive to altitude sickness or whatever. Yeah. It's not something you can train for. You know? Yeah. It's like, it's also like a guy that doesn't train for the marathon. Somebody has been training for a fucking year and then some guy just gets up and (laughs) runs it. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah. That's uh, that's that's a good story, man. Yeah. Now, did it did it inspire you to continue climbing mountains, or that was just a one off thing for you, really? No, I would I would love to do it again, but you know it has to be the right circumstances. And no. and uh, um, but you yeah. know the the same guy and I might might try to do it again sometime. Uh, we've got our eye on this place in South America called Aconcagua. That's like twenty two thousand feet, yeah. but that's a little different. You gotta you gotta know you gotta like be able to use ice axes and shit for that. Is that the know. Andes? Or Listen, yeah. I'm gonna say leave well enough alone, my friend. <laughs> you did good. good. Just leave it the fuck alone. If you start training, you'll never make it to the top. Just leave it alone. The Andes, isn't that where they ate each other, the soccer team? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. No. They did. No, yeah. Tim. Don't do it, brother. All Don't right. do it. All right. I'll stay here at sea level. Just bring enough food in you. That's all. Um That's a big accomplishment. That's kind of amazing. With a broken toe. Now, were you in pain the whole time? Um well, you know, I have the I have this weird relationship with pain, which is actually, you know, it, it, this sounds like a humble brag. It's really not, but you know how they say what's your pain level, zero to ten? I can't really tell the difference between two and eight. Like anything between two and eight feels like mildly uncomfortable. Cause uh like five years ago, I was skiing and I broke both my legs. And um and I like got up and I skied down and I was, I said to my friends, ah, I think I sprained my ankle. I'm going to go over to the ski patrol and get some ice on it. And so we took a chairlift up, skied down to ski patrol. I walked in there and I said, I think I sprained my ankle. And I took my ski boot off and my ankle went swole up like this and turned green and purple. And they said, anything else? And I said, I think I tweaked my knee. And so they sent me to the emergency room and it turns out I fractured my tibial plateau, which is really bad. Um, and I, I was never like in what I would describe as pain. I was just kind of like uncomfortable, like, you know, like a long airplane ride where you can't get comfortable in the seat. That that's what it felt like to me. So my, my toe was not a big issue on Kilimanjaro. Wow. You're lucky. <laughs> You're like a fucking Superman. Yeah. Wow. yeah <laughs> except, except it has its downsides because sometimes like, you know, you're walking around bleeding and like you really like I really should not have skied down with two broken legs. That's really fucking stupid. Right. If I had, if my pain was better, you know, suited to the 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 severity of the injury, I would have laid there and had sure. them take me down in a sled or whatever. That is hilarious. Tim, thank you so much, man. I couldn't thank you enough for doing this. Really. It means a lot and I appreciate it. I haven't seen you forever, but thank you so much. It's so good to see you guys. You guys look great, man. It's really good to see you. Wow. Stay off them Thank fucking you. mountains. Okay. Stay I'm going to stay on the ground. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for friend. doing this, my friend. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay, you. gentlemen. All the thanks. best. Take care. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you. Tim Daly. Yes, incredible sir. story. Yeah. Incredible. Really enjoyed talking to him. That was great, man. Really, yeah, really, really good. good. All right. Let's uh, take a break and get into the episode. Uh, season six, episode nine, The Ride, one of your favorite episodes. Michael. One of my favorites as an actor. I really enjoyed doing this one. It was a lot of fun and a, a, and great, just great material to act. I mean, it was a blast. A lot like, going on. A lot going on. A in lot this, going on. This aired this May 7th. This the first, uh, May 7th, 2006, written by Terry Winter, 13 of the 19 he did. Directed by Alan Taylor. Now, they, usually there's what four stories going on, right? Usually so, three, A and A, B and C. Usually, a, for the most part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, usually this one, the C is this, the little one. This seems like there's a little more going on. There's a lot. Well, Christopher gets married. Uh, there's Pauly. the ride incident. There's the Paulie incident. There's a lot of stuff going on. You see, you see Tony and Phil do a little bonding here, kind of. Pushing Johnny Sack off to the side. I think a lot. What's interesting about it is called the ride, and you you, you think about the ride is the, obviously the amusement park. There's rides. It's a thrill ride. People pay money to escape the mundane to get a thrill. A lot of this episode is about boredom. You know, we talked about this, the regularness of life that Christopher mentioned. Juliana Skiff mentioned she wanted to escape boredom. There's a lot about boredom and what you do for excitement in this episode. It's all over this episode. We're going to get into it. 
Uh, the focus of this episode is the feast. They call it the Feast of St. Elziar. St. Elziar was a French saint, lived in the um, 12, eight, from 1285 to 1323. But it's based on the Feast of St. Gerard, which is uh, in the first ward of Newark. He was from Naples, St. Gerard. He was the son of a tailor. And it was, uh, you know, when we did this, they got a real feast. They hired the guys that do real feasts. They this made a feast, right? They ordered the, all the carts was, and the, the attractions. And it was all. a full-blown feast. So it was kind of impressive. You thought you were at the feast. Absolutely. So those of you that don't know, the most famous piece, uh, feast is the St. Gennaro Feast, one of the most famous. Uh, and there's also a lot of small feasts around, usually in the summer or the fall when the weather is nice. And uh, a lot of it, the money goes to charities and churches, and like we see here. Uh, I find this weird. We're in Kelly's apartment. Uh, Christopher's watching Saw 2. We never saw Kelly before. All of a sudden, Kelly comes out of nowhere. We're in uh, towards the end of season six, and Christopher has a obviously a girlfriend. I don't know how long he's been with her. But he's been with her a while because the guys know her. And she comes out and she's very scared to tell him she's pregnant. She's apologetic. He's she watching said, Saw in the beginning, which, again, here's we, we talk about the ride, the thrill. Watching something horrible, scary, violent for a thrill to escape kind of the mundane. Are you into those movies? Scary? No, no. Horror movies, slasher no, movies? Not at all. I, I'm not. That's my least favorite genre of any of the Film genres. I'm not what's your a, favorite? What's your what's the scariest movie you ever saw? Exorcist. That's a good one. That's I a think great I one. think it's still the scariest to this day. That's a scary movie. You know, for me, I mean, The Shining was really scary. I saw it in the movies when it came out. I guess I was like twelve or something. That was really scary. It was very disturbing. Obviously, Kubrick and and Stephen King made a great combination for for horror. But there was a the, the the movie that really freaked me out as a kid was a TV movie about Houdini. Remember the guy who played Starsky, Paul Michael uh -huh. Glazer? Yeah, yeah. He did a TV movie about Houdini, and there was a scene where they were doing the seance, and he was contacting, I think it was his mother or his wife. And because he Houdini was into psychics, and he debunked a lot of them. But there was this one scene where he really connected, this psychic really connected to this ghost. And that, I was never so scared from a movie than that. Really? Yeah. I, I don't like scary movies. Do you watch them now? You know, I like more, I, I like stuff like The Shining, like uh, demonic possession, ghosts. I don't like slasher. I don't like violence and no, that kind of I stuff. I mean, all the blood and all the stuff. No, that, I, I don't, don't watch, like I just... Gloss over all that stuff. I, I love The Shining. I think it's great. Yeah, I uh, saw it many years ago. I love The Exorcist. The Exorcist is fantastic. It's still, it just, it, it, it still holds up. And oh, scary. absolutely. Uh, you know, Christopher says, stop talking. Let's get married. She's saying, I'll call the clinic to get an abortion. I love you. Uh, and then he says, my ex, she couldn't have kids. I wanted them so bad. You could bet, which is true. But well, you could bet she's having some other guy's asshole kids the fucking tramp. Now, has Christopher told this lie so much that he actually believes it? It's so weird. Yes, because he gets really emotional as if this really happened. Correct. And it didn't. But, um, you know, that happens. Sometimes people tell lies so much they actually believe that it happened. Yeah, I think it's more he's he's directing the kind of comp complex emotions of the whole Adriana thing outward in some direction. By the way, Kelly is played by Cara Bono, who uh, was on Mad Men. Uh, oh, she's done a lot of work. Done she's a great. lot of work. She's also a writer and a producer, and she was just lovely. Um, I just adored working with her. She was a great uh, addition to the cast and really fun to work with. What's interesting, now going back to the theme I said about boredom and stuff, Kelly is not Adrian. Adriana and Christopher had a very combustible, toxic relationship. Adriana tried really hard, but the two of them were like, you know, part of, I think, the excitement was that it, that it was toxic. Um, 
Adriana was very exciting in a lot of ways with, you know, her outward appearance and being into the music business and they did drugs together and, and, and uh, they were kind of like running and gunning together in a way. Kelly is kind of like this much more subdued, kind of boring in a way in comparison. Not, I don't mean her performances because it's no, not no, right no, on. No. But you know what I mean? It's like he's choosing to kind of go for something a little bit less exciting here, go for a relationship that's less exciting. I think that's another example of the themes that play out in this episode. Well, I think she's more uh, your traditional marriage material, wife material maybe, you know? Yeah, uh, Kelly. I mean, Adriana could know. have been, but I think Christopher was too fucked up to allow that to happen. But um, And I also think, you know, uh, I, I don't think Kelly... Does it seem the drug type? She no. just seems just a different person. I, you yeah. know, and listen, sometimes sometimes uh, people go out with the same kind of boyfriend, girlfriend. It's always like the same. Over right? and like, over again. Yeah, it's like, you know, they, they have a type. That's what they like. Not always. She's uh, nothing. She's nice looking in her own way, just completely different than uh, Adriana. Yeah. You know, uh, Patsy and Paulie arrive. We're at the church. They take a look at uh, uh, the statue. Says it needs a little shellac. Uh, it's a little beat up. You know, the patron saint of uh, what does he say? Zeppola. You like yeah. Zeppolas? Oh, who does it? How could you? Do not you like them? Like do you like them with salt or with sugar? Sugar uh, with sugar. We talked about this before. We did. Never right? had them with salt. We're already repeating ourselves. But huh? I've had them. Stuff with regatta. Oh, Have you had really that? Good. Yeah, that's really that's good. That's good. Stuff with regatta. I've never had them with salt. Uh, good with salt, yeah. You know, uh, you know. so the, the feast, Father Felix uh, brought me up to speed. Father Jose says, uh, I'd like to hear your ideas for this year. He says, Paul, he says, not much to talk about. It's done through our nonprofit corporation. All sort of done, you get your end. Paul, he gets right to the chase. There's not much to this. We handle everything. You'll get your $10,000. So far, Jose, he's got big balls. He's yeah. going to shake down Paulie Walnuts. Well, they've that, been getting probably this 10 grand's probably been for, for years and years and years, right? For years and years and years. And I, like he says, I don't want to rock the boat. It's just given the current cost, we feel an increase is overdue. And he doesn't hesitate. He wants 50 grand. And he says, listen, you get money from the vendors. So how the feast works, right? You know, he gets the hat and the statue from the church. The church gets ten grand. Paulie, which of course Tony and Paulie and everyone else, they the vendors pay them to rental space, like rental space. He hires the rides, right? But the rental space, the Zeppelis, the sausage and pepper, uh, the Brajols, the whatever else they're selling there, they all got to pay the get into the feast, you know, right? And, and they probably give a cut. And the T-shirts and everything else. So he's getting money every which way. And like he says, you pay an $18 fee to rent out land that you don't even own. Right. I mean, this is the ultimate score for them, which has been going on for years and years and years. But now this guy says, I want $50,000. That's a more equitable donation. And... uh Paulie gets a little nasty here. He says, you think it pays for itself? So it seems to me the church has plenty of it in its coffers to pay for all those pedophilia lawsuits. Right. I mean, he goes right for the juggler there. Yeah, and he says this was Johnny Soprano's feast for years and years and years. You know, uh, he's talking about uh, that this is the way it is, that they need the hat. Uh, that's part of the thing, you know, uh, you know, and people says, uh, gave their wedding rings to melt down, you know. Right. Uh, this is a big thing of pride for the neighborhood for, you know, for years and years. It's a tradition. And he kind of holds the hat hostage a little bit here. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, if you would demonstrate to me that you take this feat seriously as the people who began it. He wants 50 grand. He does a great job. Jonathan Del Arco plays Father Jose. Patsy looks at Paulie, when he says the pedophilia line, like, oh, like, whoa, 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 take it easy yeah. here. Uh, Father Jose's got some balls. He's not intimidated. He's not in intimidated. And at the end of this conversation, he just says, fuck the hat. Now, that's 
going to come back to to bite him in the ass a little bit. We'll get into that. Uh, Tony, Sylvia, Paulie, Patsy are at the bar. Great song, Flash and Crash by Rocky and the Riddlers, a Seattle garage band uh, song was cut in 1966. They're, they're talking, uh, Tony, just a man I wanted to see. I got to go to Pennsylvania and I'm going to need some backup. Where the fuck you been? He tells Christopher, who shows his ring. He says, you're a newly married man. Interesting for- connection because we just mentioned the hat with the wedding. It uh, was made from wedding rings and now Christopher is showing a wedding ring. What the fuck brought this on? Visit from the stalk. You never heard of pulling out. They're joking. Uh, he co- uh, he says that uh, Paulie's the VP in charge of Calzones, which is a funny line. Yeah. Uh, and Paulie gets a call from the doctor's office. Uh, he says, tell Dr. Sapola. Which means that- onion. Dr. Onion. Dr. Sapola, that I don't uh, pay for missed appointments. But uh, Jason Sapola was David Chase's driver. Right. He was a teamster driver. Uh, he was uh, one of the guys, terrific guy, played basketball at Syracuse. And uh, he was around for many years. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when Christopher says, you know, Tony, you're my example. Uh, you know, between you, the wisdom and AA, these are building blocks, home, family. Silvio says that's what it's all about right when the blonde stripper yeah, is delivering absolutely. champagne, which is kind of funny. Yeah. He says, I'll just have water. My son's going to be my strength. There's something in this episode and what and what he's – Christopher's doomed, obviously, and he does – really aspire to this he does want his family he wants a wife and he wants, he wants it but he's a junkie and he's a bullshit he's artist just uh it's the sadness is that he does want these things and he's just not capable of having them manifest in his life it's just not and and you see it throughout this episode and it's very sad but let me ask you something uh okay many uh, a person has been a terrible junkie terrible drug addicts terrible alcoholics and they Stayed at it, stayed at it, and they beat it. Some people were literally on the street. Couldn't be worse. Is it possible that you could just not get sober, no matter how bad you want to? 100%. Or is it that they don't want to? Do you think every alcoholic wants to get sober? It's not cut and dry like that. It's it's a it's a it's a lot of causes and conditions that go into these these things and 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 it's it's just not that simple, um, you know they may want to like Corky says in that scene when with Christopher yeah yeah I got to get my act together while he's shooting up heroin you know what I mean so you know you may go through sometimes you know it's a wake up call you almost die or you fucking you know fall down the stair you know sometimes it takes that sometimes people die of it. I mean, listen, I lost two friends last year who never got off the train. You know what I mean? The, yeah. the, and, um, you know, they they had all the warning signs. and, 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 and But uh, is it that they no. want to? Sometimes they just don't want I'm to. I'm saying it's some, one day you may want to, and then the next day, you know, you have something happens and sets you off, and you're the only, you're, you're not, you don't have your shit together, and you go back. I mean, yeah, you may want to. It's not maybe necessarily a permanent state of mind that you want to. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, then I think that some people they say I like to go out. I'm gonna, I'm I'm just gonna. This is what I want to do. I want to sit around. I want to get fucked up. I don't care. This is what I do, even though it's destroying my life. I believe. Yeah, some but of that. that in itself is a certain psychological. I just had a friend die, thing. 61 years old, drank all day. He was a functioning alcoholic. Owned a yeah. shopping center in Vegas. Drank I mean, for by eight functioning. hours a day. He took care of his business. He paid his bills. He was married with a kid. He would do what he had to do in the morning, then drink all day, go home and eat dinner, go to sleep and do it all over again. Yeah, and it killed him. Uh, well, he got, you know went for a bike ride, and he died at 61. He was physically... Heart attack? In decent shape, a heart attack. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tragic thing. I think he, you know, and I, I really see the kind of sadness because it's like his sobriety and, you know, it's just so tenuous and fragile. It doesn't, it, it, it not enough to take in this, you know. The construction site, Tony and Christopher meet with Eddie. Uh, this is out in Pennsylvania. You know how to get back. Christopher, I map blasted it. What was that? Uh, pr- uh, before GPS? 
Yeah, you go you you go on the computer and they you put in your where you're going and they'd give you a series of directions. You print it out and then you'd have it in the car and it would be like in point seven miles make a right onto you know yeah. so you, you know. Yeah. I um, tell you, it's it's amazing how before we had all this, you know, like used to have maps and how well, you yeah, you'd get directions anything. from someone and write them down. Make a left on you know. I used to deliver pizza. I used to deliver pizza when I first got to Vegas in 1979. I mean, I had to uh, ask <laughs> people directions. Make a left, make a right, make a left, make a right. No cell phones. I mean, you were screwed. You know, um, yeah, it, it it is. And some people don't even trust, like, like the uh, older people sometimes don't trust, like, the GPS. Like, when you put in the ways, which computes the actual traffic time live traffic through whatever satellites and stuff and so i, I know some people like it no no it's taking you way out of the way i'm saying it's computing the fastest route you know what i mean it's like it may take you out of the way but the way you know how to go is takes too long uh possibly but then you also get some of these uber guys they don't know the city well, and, if there's a closure, then you're screwed because they don't yeah, know where to go. They don't know what's going on. Because so that doesn't always show up on the on the on the GPS. If there's if, if all of a sudden the entrance to the bridge gets closed, they don't know where to go. Correct. Tony, Tony, uh, look, they, they were a little lost. Look, Pittsburgh was supposed to be headed east. Got to take a piss. He pulls up behind the building. He takes a piss. He sees guys loading a truck. Tony says, "Look, wooden crates. It's good wine." Now, again, the boredom thing. Obviously, it's not a big score. This is the head of the family taking a chance. That's what like I mean. This. It's boredom. They're doing it for fun. They don't need the, I mean, certainly it's like, it's not It's not life-changing money. It's not even that big of a score. It's a couple of bottles, of, a couple of cases of wine, but he wants to do it. Chris wants to do it because they, they want fun. They want excitement. They want a disruption to the boredom that they're experiencing in and their life. And to these psychopaths, Killing or so shooting someone and stealing wine is a good time. That's and boy, they talk about it over and over and over. They just, this was the time of their life. This was a good, a good time. Yeah. A good time for them. The Old wine is a, is a Bordeaux, Chateau, Pichon, Lalande. Uh, the 86 that they mentioned right now, you can buy for $335 a bottle. So it's and, about and, four grand a case. And Christopher sold five Sounds cases. Like $5 a bottle. $5 a bottle. Yeah. 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 Christopher, a very dim bowl. <laughs> he very doesn't, dim uh, bowl. you know, he, uh, we'll get to it later about the wine. Uh, mm. You know, they start shooting out. Christopher gets in the car. Tony drives away. Christopher shoots the Viper. He uh, hits him and he's very excited. Oh, yeah. Like he didn't expect to, 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 to hit him. I hit him. I hit him. I hit him. Uh, I, I'm surprised the head of the family is going to fuck around with something like this. It's totally out of boredom. Could you see a, Paul Castellano stealing bottles of wine? No, but he's not Tony Soprano. Tony Soprano yeah. is a little different. Uh, no, he absolutely is. They're, They're having different. fun. Rod's, go- that's Rod's Steakhouse in Morristown, which they go. They talk about autumn and the crisp air. and the You like autumn? like the Yeah. The, yeah. I like autumn. Because you spring. don't like the heat so much. No. So when I like the, the seasons winter. change, you like that little crispness, chill in the air. You wear the a jacket. summer is my least favorite time of the year. See, summer's my favorite, I think. I hate the heat. I can't handle the humidity, man. Can't handle it. Well, I was just in California. It's 75 and cool at night. It's 75 it's every day, yeah. The problem is it gets monotonous. Like, the weather never changes, so you kind of get – it gets a little – gets to well, me. Well, in Vegas, uh, the sun shines 336 – Days a year. That's 336? 36 days a year. Wow. That's monotonous. That's monotonous. Wow. Oh, my God. Because every day you think, I got to get up and do something. At least in New York, it's a cloudy day. It's a rainy day. I like it. I like it. Say, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to read it. going to hang out. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, great. You don't drink anymore. But in the old days, a, a crisp day that's raining is a great day to Go to the bar about four o'clock and fucking drink. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rainy days are good days to drink. Rainy days. It's raining right now. <laughs> yeah, but it's the summer. It's hot. Uh, Tony and Christopher pull into the restaurant. That was fucking awesome. Old school shit, Christopher says. Uh, Tony sprained his ankle without knowing it. Uh, they got two bottles of wine. 
Tell them they're in the restaurant. Uh, What's your corkage fee? Corkage fee. Do you ever do that? Did you ever bring bottles of wine in a restaurant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to do that. They charge you twenty dollars usually, yeah. unless they know you. You know, then they let you slide. But and then some restaurants are pigs about it. But listen, they got to make something. Sure. I mean, that's why I mean. You they can't go and something. bring. You can't bring your no. dinner into a restaurant. No, no. I, I you know, twenty twenty five dollars is fair. No. You know, I mean, they got to, you know, I get that. Listen, all these restaurants in New Jersey, a lot of them are BYOB. I don't even know how they make a living. Really? You know, it's I didn't hard know to that. get a liquor license in New Jersey. Wow. It's different than in New York City, yeah. Wow. And uh, a lot of them, you bring your own wine, liquor, wine, you know. Yeah. A much cheaper night out if you drink it, you know. They, they're, it's a... Uh... They sh- it should be easier if you if you have a real business, a restaurant, or, you know, you may, a, a nice bar or something. It should be easier to get a liquor license. They make you jump through fucking hoots. It's really expensive, and it's like it's like they don't want you to do business. You know, it's uh, horrible. Well, you had a liquor license. That could have been easy. Yeah. Well, no, my wife had it before me. She got she it. had it. Okay. Yeah. But no, you got to get a lawyer, and it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, th- Tony, you know, so they're they're eating dinner. And Tony is just savoring this wine. He loves it. It you is good wine. It. I've the, had it. Yeah, the Believe look it. on his face. Uh, and they're uh, reminiscing about what just happened a little while ago. I'm with the Vipers, and they're joking, and they're laughing. And Christopher says, you know, uh, I got to be honest. When he pulled the trigger, I almost shit myself. And he says, I miss it. I'll be honest, the wine. Tony is just loving it. You can see the look Loving it. it. And he says, you got to toast your wedding. You had a kid. And Christopher says, discipline, set limits. This is, for an addict, it's just not, this doesn't work. Yeah, this but c- wait a minute. I've known people that drank, they got sober. I'm talking over a time now. I'm not talking yeah. two weeks sober. Yeah. Over time, they stopped drinking four years, five years. And then kind of regrouped. And then they just, hey, you know, yeah. they're a little older. That's, un- that's un- much, much more uncommon. Yeah, a little older. And they say, I just drink wine and kind of have it together. Yeah, that's that's much less uh, common, that kind of thing. Sure. any, I mean, anything's possible. But You see, m- once you go sober, once you, so you're saying. If once, you really have a problem. If you have a problem. Yeah. And, and I have a problem. And I say, I've stopped drinking because I got a problem. There's no going back once you make that commitment. Listen, once not it's not one size fits all either. Some people also, you know, they become kind of, you know, they start abusing substances because of their circumstance. So like everybody around them's doing shit or they work in a bar and as soon as the customer's gone, they start drinking or they start doing drugs and like sometimes it's circumstantial and then they move, they they go into a different career, they're not you know, you know, they get things change. Sometimes that's enough, sometimes it's not. You know what I mean? But um, for Christopher, he's just totally deluded about this. There's that episode of The Simpsons, which I think is funny, with Homer and Ned Flanders go to Vegas. And uh, Homer convinces to have a drink. And Ned Flanders, is he's a religious guy. hes He's been sober or whatever. He has a white wine spritzer. And he has this white wine spritzer. And the next thing he knows, he wakes up. It's like that. I mean, maybe The Hangover was based on this. <laughs> There's women, they're married, there's a tiger, there's like, they, you know, they won this That's money, they're funny. in a suite, they don't know what the fuck happened. You know, it's like, so, and, and Christopher is like, that one drink, and we see it in this episode, that one drink sends him right well, back. Did her. you ever see the, you saw the episode of the Twilight Zone, when uh, the guy's religious and he's, him and his wife went a trip to Vegas, and they never, uh, he doesn't gamble, he's very against gambling, very, very, very. And she gambles a little, and then the machine is calling him, and he goes down. Yes, that's great. Yeah. He goes down, he loses everything, he's right, you know, just lost everything, and the machine, he's seeing the machine in his room. <laughs> hey, 
People go off the deep what end. What was that movie with Albert Brooks? Uh, it was a Gary Marshall played the casino owner. Remember yeah. that movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was very funny. Uh, he lost all that money. Tries yeah, they to went convince in the him RV. to get it back. Yeah, they went in the RV. <laughs> Something in America. Lost in America. He lost tries to convince the casino to give. It'll be like you're the nice casino. You, you yeah. know, you see that I took a. Uh, Lost in America. You see, I took a hit. You, you're going to be the nice casino. You're going to help me out and give it back. He's like, no, that's not how it works. It's very funny. not how it works. You know, you lose. A, a our business funny. is you lose and we keep the money. Listen, uh, I've seen many a person. I've told you this a lot of times. They go to Vegas. You got any bad habits? It's going to rear its ugly head. I've seen people lose their fucking mind for days, for years, for months. I've seen yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, a guy comes out there, a businessman, all of a sudden, you know, he's with, you know, street walking hookers. And it's like, what happened to this guy? He walked in here, he was sober. He was a businessman. He was sharp. You know, you see him now, it's five in the morning. The sun is coming up and this guy's insane. Right. And only going to get more insane. You know, right. they just think, you know, they like check their life at the airport and just, you know. Go into do what the fuck ever. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Uh, so the talk about what happened. Uh, uh, they pour a glass of wine. They toast Christopher. You know that old. You know, I, I just got to set boundaries. You know, people do that. I used to do that with diets when I was always on a diet. I would do that. I would get disgusted. I would lose some weight, and then I would go, "All right, I'm going to get off this fucking diet, but I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to, you know." And then. You know, three days right. later, I'm just back to the same shit. Yeah, because it's got. It's going to take more than that. It's got. It's a. It's an inside thing in your relationship to food and your relationship to your life. And I mean, I lost sure. 25 pounds a year for 20 years. You know what I mean? Sure. You know, the outside of the restaurant, Tony and Christopher, they walk out. They're both drunk, a little tipsy. Uh, I'm gonna have to sleep on my back. The shit they're we've full. been done. The shit we've done. The shit we we've been through with like the three musketeers, which is now, funny. Is that is he talking about Paulie? Maybe. I think he's just saying just, me and you just, just drunk. <laughs> we got a bond. It's very special. You saved my life in a lot of ways. And this is one know, of my favorite scenes. That that sentimental talk. Uh, we never did that. When no. we were drinking, we didn't get into that. But a lot of people do, and I don't yeah. like that. But I like I like the scene. I liked. I remember yeah. playing it. We, we you know I enjoyed it a lot. It's Jim's really good in the scene. It was really fun. Um, but people get into heavy talks when they drink. I don't like that. That drives me crazy. Yeah, and then he said, you, "You don't like getting too deep when you get no. drunk." I no. love you, man. That whole that no. That I'm out of there. You start that shit, I'm gone. I don't want to hear that. I love you, my best friend. Uh, uh, you always hey, hear that from me. You know, uh, you know, you got a problem with you. You said something. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, often it's either it's either one or the other. Either they, they love you and they're in love and they always did, or they you you're an asshole and you you think exactly. you're better than. Me. I, I don't you. like any of that. I also don't like going out with guys. That they're normal, then they have a few drinks, and then they're like a time bomb. The Jekyll and Hyde. Thing. Yeah, they're a time bomb. They might get into a beef. They might start yelling at the the bartender. You know what I mean? Like you know, yeah, all night long you're on fucking edge. Like you know, yeah. this guy might. You know, I don't want. I don't want that. Oh I God, it. I can't stand that. Yeah, you know, then you just don't don't go out with them anymore. But I st I I. I I've had those moments personally. Yeah, I was with you a couple of times, but few and far between. Oh, but it happened. But for the most part, you were normal. Yeah, yeah at few normal, and far I between. Um, I love the scene. I love playing it, the, and then it goes into remember what happened. You always had my back, especially that day when I came to the house. Now, they cut from here. We go back in time to the scene that was cut from long term parking to create more tension to not give away what was going to happen to Adriana. Um, this was a really hard scene to do. It was a hard scene for me to watch when I watched it yesterday uh, for a number of reasons. Um, Jim and I, I remember we went, you know, we went out after this scene. We were in a very weird place and difficult place uh, after doing that scene. Um, I think we might have been in difficult places in our lives personally at the time and doing the scene I remember it was, we went out and we were, 
we were not in good heads, you know. Um, it was a difficult, it was a difficult day and a difficult time. Uh, I, I, for some reason, a difficult time in our lives. I mean, I don't usually talk about this shit, but um, yeah, we had similar demons, I'll be honest with you. And, and uh, this was one of those days. So, so uh, when, when you did the scene, uh, and this was what, a year before, no? Yeah, because Long Term Parking was season five. Yeah. So it was a year before. Christopher comes in. I got to talk to you. Christopher looks banged up. Yeah, uh, bang, really banged up. He looks He's been banged up all up. night. He's been trying to figure out what to do. And he goes to Tony. Now, now, obviously, going to Tony, he's made that decision. He's going to Tony. He's not going to ride off into the sunset and go into witness protection and, and live happily ever after with Adriana. He's going to Tony, which means he knows what Tony's going to do. Yeah, but I think also, I, I think... For there's a moment here from the look on Tony's face that he may possibly kill Christopher now. Oh, 100 percent. Like he says, how what does she know? How long does he's she know? taking like, a yeah. chance right now? And he hugs him and says, I'll take care of it. But there's a, there's some doubt oh, 100%. Uh, that Christopher's not in on this somehow, some way. Uh, and even if he inadvertently told her stuff, that's cause for him to be killed. Even if he just, you know, obviously he wasn't going to snitch, but told her, hey, we just killed blah, blah, blah. Confided too much when he's high, when he's drunk, when they're in bed, pillow talk. That's what hey, he's worried about, of course. Of course. You know what? You know what we did. You know what happened, which happens all the time. Kind of bragging, right? And she told me last night, what did she give him? I don't know. Where is she? She's home. And then he breaks down. I can't do it. I can't do it. Don't make me do it. I mean, he loves Adriana. I guess the worst thing, he would probably rather kill himself than kill her. Right. It would obviously be easier for Christopher to do it because she's going to, you know, he could just say, let's go. We got to get out now and take yeah. her out into the woods and kill her. And she'd trust him, but he can't do it. He's not. He good says, I'm going to take care of it. You do something, have a cup of coffee. And he did take care of it. Yes. And a very smart way. Uh, the audience at the time didn't see it coming. No, I, it was a smart move to take this scene. It out. was very and, much and, so. And I'm glad. I'm also glad that they kept the scene and it had a life in another episode. And Tony checks Christopher for a wire himself. Yeah. And he says, "How can you think that? Uh, I'll take care of it." And he hugs him. Very, uh, very much fatherly son here, you know. Uh, yeah, and then they cut back to the exterior of the restaurant, and we, uh, Jim, and I fought. I think both Terry and Alan on this, we didn't want to do this huggy, I love you, man, kind of moment. We kind of felt it was a little bit um, over the top. And we saw it more just us sitting kind of quietly in our own space, maybe saying it. And they pushed for it. And we eventually kind of relented and did And do it. you think it was the right thing now? In yeah, state? especially the way Alan shot it. The, the, the shot from behind us. You know, yeah. Um, and just seeing the two of us, the way he framed it. I mean, I guess you know when you're shooting as an actor, you're shooting a scene like that. You don't, you're not really quite sure how it's going to wind up on screen, what it's going to communicate. Like, um, well, he might have actually convinced us through saying this is the way it's going to be shot. It's not just going to be this close up of Jim and I hugging each other because we felt it was a little melodramatic. But in when you see the final, uh, the version is certainly not. No, and that's why. He's a great director, you know. Yeah. I mean, and Terry's a brilliant writer. They could see uh, a lot of times what an actor can't see. Yeah, I, I agree. Right? Uh, Tony and Christopher driving home. That's a Midnight Rider by the great Buddy Miles, who was in the Band of Gypsies with Jimi Hendrix. Uh, the Soprano Kitchen. Tony makes coffee. He's hung over. Do you drink coffee anymore? Every day. Uh, the oh, first, you are? The first thing I do, I'm very addicted to caffeine. Oh, I didn't know. I thought I maybe you, you had a Buddhist had a thing about killing coffee Buddhists beans. Buddhists don't have a thing about uh, coffee, coffee beans? beans. They're not sentient beings. They don't, they don't, uh, they coffee don't Coffee beans, it, like uh, you could kill a coffee bean. Buddhists beans. don't have things about booze per se. There's a lot of Buddhists who drink. There's not, there's not like a, Buddhism is not, I, I mean, I've said this before, it's not a thing of like these rules and stuff like that. So you could drink if you're a Buddhist. 
depends on what your personal teacher wants and the type of work that he's doing. That has nothing to do with why you don't drink anymore. Uh, it's, it contributes to it because my yeah. teacher doesn't want his, uh, prefers his students not to uh, uh, do anything mind altering. Although he does say, well, you know, if you once in a while, it's okay. But once in a while is not so good for me. But in this scene, when he's watching the car, again, back to that thing of boredom, he just looks so fucking bored. He had this crazy night. They robbed this place. They get drunk. They ha they bond. They talk about old times. And now he's standing there watching the coffee drip. And he's just fucking. Yeah, but is it most people? Aren't most people bored? I'm not. You're never bored. I mean, I'm once in a while, but I feel I feel very uh, excited by life and it's inspired. I'm not I'm bored, bored at all. I'm not. I'm, I'm busy working lately. I'm, I'm not lot. bored. Not I'm at all. busy working a lot, but there's times where I, I'm just bored. Like, all right, you know what? You know, I mean, I don't I'm not. Find you know, I spend a lot more time now with my family with my, my wife, for sure, than I used to, because just because, I don't know, I was traveling, running around. I don't know what the fuck I was doing. But uh, I could see people getting bored. And I think that's why guys go to the bar and have a shot and a beer after work and before work. And, you know, retired guys, they're bored. And they go to the country club and, you, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know? I guess so. I think that's the point that they're making here. Isn't that a big? Isn't that a, a part of the? Uh, a guy gets sober, he's got all them hours to fill, where he was drinking. Well, and you got to figure out what to fill it with. That's what I'm know? saying. I mean, a lot of people. I was talking to someone who was dealing with this, and I said, "You got to start to." you know, do stuff because like you said, uh, people who just, you know, sat around, you drink, do stuff with you, do stuff that excites you, stuff you want to do. Or if you, if you can't find stuff you want to do, at least go help other people that need it. Yeah. Do some volunteer work, go do something, you know, work for some not-for-profit or charity. You can use your time to be a benefit to other people. Why not? Yeah. No, I, I think that's an inside job. I mean, you're bored only if you allow yourself to be bored. I'll be honest with you. Uh, house for sale. Interesting Christmas. here. Yeah. De interesting detail. Pagano Realty. You remember from Where to Eternity, the first, and we're going to see a little bit of this coming up. Paulie Walnuts, when he, when the psychic says, I see Pagano, little Sonny Pagano was the first person Paulie killed. Ah, okay. Okay, I don't remember that. Yes, this is going to- I remember the scene. This is going to come back later in the episode. Pagano Realty. Uh, Christopher and Kelly arrive at the house. This is what I'm talking about. Stately Wayne Manor, which is from Batman. He's trying uh, to be Tony Soprano and it's, and he's, he's over his head. He doesn't even want to look at the house. He sees it. It, 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 it checks all the boxes for him. Stately Wayne Manor, but he's over his head. Yeah, probably financially, probably everything, you know, we'll yeah. take it. I mean, he's not joking. And this is what we call an no. impulse buyer. She says, shouldn't we see the inside first? Uh, you know, if it has an inside, we're buying it. He likes what he sees. It does remind him of Tony Soprano. Uh, uh, St. Elzea, uh, the, the festival. That's Bram Hall Avenue, Jersey City, where we did that feast. Well, uh, Paulie collects money from John. Where's the rest? Five days rent in advance. I mean, Paulie is ruthless here. He's just a fucking... Nickel and diamond. He's a corrupt fucking landlord, getting shit for free. Every Wrap which up way. a dozen t-shirts. Give me the, 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 the espresso. I mean, Paulie's just, uh, you know, he's a terror. He's been doing this for years, and, you know, he's just... Uh, kind of loves it, too. He's the man here. He likes know? being the king of the feast. Uh, Tony comes over. He pulls Phil Leotardo aside. Uh... You know, they they uh, diverted a truck, a couple of Lebanese guys, uh, a semi-trailer full of Centrum multivitamins. <laughs> and Phil says that's a good score. <laughs> yeah, that's a fucking score. Yeah, the thing is we got to load it uh, out of state. Long Island's okay. Troops are on it. You're interested 50-50, but that's about now, tonight. And he floats the idea that, Let's not bother Johnny Sack with this. So he's not going to kick anything up to Johnny and Tony. Tony okay likes the idea. Tony uh, likes the idea. Now, how would they get rid of these vitamins? What do you think? I'm curious. Well, they probably have guys that fence stuff. 
They go to the drugstore. They say, I could give well, you... Well, I don't know if they're going to have all night long going to go to different drugstores, but they probably have outs of guys that sell... I've talked about this before. I used to sell leisure suits. I used to sell padded uh, toilet seats. I used to, So there's guys that sell stuff. Right. And the guys, no guys, street guys. And the guy might take... Give me 100 cases. Give me 50 And how cases. does he sell those, though? That's what I'm oh, saying. Oh, he'll sell them. That Where? guy. Where will he sell them? The on guy the that buys them? Yeah, he'll yeah. sell them on the street. Like oh, yeah. set up a table yeah, somewhere like, or something? No, yeah. Not a table, but he'll be like down the basement in the social club. Like, spread the word. Hey, let everybody How many know. vitamins can he sell? I, I got vitamins. I take vitamin every morning for years. You don't think he? they go to like a, some guy who owns a pharmacy somewhere? You want to buy it? Could get you this I, half price. I think that guy does. Independent Not the guys with the truck. They yeah, do. They do. There's another guy in between. Once it hits the streets. The fence. Once it hits the streets, then they're doing it. Hey, they go into families. They might sell it to some younger kids. Give them a deal and they'll sell it. Right. You know, and so on and so on. Everybody gets a little taste, you know. Right. They're expensive vitamins, aren't they? They're expensive, yeah. Yeah. You know. uh, interesting in this scene that he sees Juliana Skiff on the ride. having On a the ride. ride. Again, boredom. He was he wanted Juliana out of a thing of sexual attraction, obviously, but also excitement. He tried to, he, he, he didn't do that, and then he resented the fact that he didn't do it, and he took it out on Carmel in the last episode, and he's seeing her kind of giving in to this abandon of having fun, which he didn't. It's an interesting, it's an interesting little detail. You know, uh, I love uh, food from these places. I mean, I always have to have Zeppelin. Sausage and pepper. Got to have a sausage and pepper. You know, they now they have pizza, they have calzones. Listen, I was in 2019, and I'm very proud of this. People are left. I was the grand marshal of the St. Gennaro Feast here. That's a big City. deal. And it's a was, really big deal. There was a lot of great people before me. Uh, you know, a lot I've of great people. I've never done that. They would want why you. Don't, why don't you throw, put a word in for me? I will put a word in for you. I don't know if they want me. You don't like that kind of stuff. I love it. I love the San Gennaro. Well, I used to go when we were kids. We'd drive down. When you were a little kid, that was a very exciting thing. They have you. Uh, they have somebody for this year, 2021. Who? Who do they have? They have someone. I don't know who, who they have. But next year, I'll get you in there if you want. Who the hell did I have? It's great. I had the float. I had my family. I had friends. I waved. Uh, oh, your friends pictures. were on the float? Yeah. We had a oh, big really? float. Big cool, float. Cool. Which friends were on the float? Because <laughs> I don't remember being there. You were in Santa Barbara. It's 2019. Oh, right, right, right. That's right. And I, I couldn't have made it. I, I, a lot of, I had my I had Willie Boy was on the float. The kids. My oh, wife. that's why. Because I'm allergic to dogs. That's we probably why a, you didn't have me. We that. had a lot of fun. Then we went to eat at Il Cortillo. You just didn't want me to steal your thunder on that. My guy. <laughs> I know how you're thinking. You're like, my, I bring Michael. They're going to cheer for him and not for me. It's going to be a whole fucking thing. See, you already have it in your head. See, that's the fucking ego. On when you. I'm on that float, I'm inviting you. Yeah, that's okay. And I don't mind taking a back seat, but you just can't do it. It's not in your fucking blood. See, I don't mind being second fiddle. I but didn't not have the you. Not you. Uh, then you see a meadow, Finn, Carmela. Carmela's eating a half a calzone. Uh, she comes out of church. She's been praying that Tony was okay. She's saying her prayers. She gives a smart remark to Meadow. What's the matter? You know, you had an operation on your knee. Now, she sees Adriana's mother. Liz. Pl played yeah. by Patty McCormick. Who did and, a great job, I thought. And in, I've in told you this. Episodes. She was nominated for an Academy Award in 1957 for the Bad Seed. The youngest ever nominated. I, I think at that time, Tatum O'Neill might have. She has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in That's 1960. Right. She's done a ton of work. She she's, uh, does a great job. Great job. She's and also Italian, which we found out. She's from Italian. Somebody. She's from Brooklyn. Born in Brooklyn. Went to New Utrecht High School. Yeah. Not far from where I grew up. Uh, and she says, uh, come on, you know, I mean, Carmela's just, you know, uh, the mother says, I haven't heard from her in two years. No birthdays, no Christmas. Oh, you didn't have the greatest relationship. You're probably drunk. She says, I'm depressed. I haven't had a drink in years. You know, I mean, 
it's pretty obvious to me that uh, Adriana didn't just disappear. Yeah, it's just hard for Carmela to process that because she d- has no context for why. Why would she disappear? Yeah. Parking lot, Christopher and Corky sit in the car. Uh, Christopher pays him for the rusty uh, hit. He shorts And, of course, him. shorts him. They all short him. And this is what they do. He pays him in heroin. You know, it's so easy because you say, well, you know, Tony, nothing this is what it. Tony wants. What can we do? There's nothing you well, can do. Well, this happens all the time. Right. This is what they do. You know, years ago, a friend of mine uh, put up money. They, they, like, uh, oh, my friend was desperate. He, he, was, he gambled. He was getting married, and he gambled $10,000, which in 1977 was an enormous amount of money. And uh, there was a wise guy in the neighborhood, and somehow he approached him and said, there's a liquor score, you know, we need some money, and if we can make a score, we'll sell the liquor, we can buy it. But gave him some big bullshit story. My friend dug up another five grand, and then he said, ah, the guys got busted. They got the money, they got the liquor, they got busted. And what was my friend going to do? He was, a, at the time, he was 20 years old, and this wise guy made up a bullshit story and just completely robbed him. You can't it. go to the cops. What are you going to do? You're fucked. You're fucked. He's fucked. Uh, you know, and, and Christopher's saying there's times when I was a kid, we're playing the floor, I got home, his knees would be filthy, my mother didn't take care of the house, a fucking pigsty, my kid would be different, he'll be proud of where he lives, proud of his house. Uh, and then Corky says, you mind if I fix? Christopher says you need to get into rehab. And then then he goes, I guess I could toot some. And it's all downhill from there. It's all downhill from there. He sees it. You know, he should have. Really, if someone's really trying to be sober, you're not going to. You're not going to have heroin. You're addicted to heroin. He has it in his pocket. He gives it to the guy. And he would have left. And Corky should have left. But yeah. Yeah. I love the way they move into this montage with the Fred Neal song, The Dolphins, and, and Christopher being high. Because you see, you see Corky shooting up, and you cut to Christopher watching. He wants to, he snorts some, he takes a hit, uh, and then you see, you cut. It looks like you're cutting back to Corky, but now it's Christopher shooting up. Yeah, uh, it's very cool. Dolphin, Fred Neal um, wrote Eddie, Everybody's Talking which is the theme song to Midnight Cowboy. Harry Nielsen. Harry Nielsen, but it was written by Fred Neal. Fred Neal was put, Fred Neal was the guy who put Dylan on stage at the Cafe Wa. He was a, a real big, um, important guy in the folk music scene in Greenwich Village in the 60s. He wrote songs for Buddy Holly, for Roy Orbison. And then he got into preservation and of dolphins and worked, you know, with dolphins in Miami at this, you know, ocean center. Uh, but he was a he was a really great songwriter, and this song I just love. What a great choice of music! What an off you know unorthodox offbeat choice, but it really works. Um, you see Christopher with this dog, which is kind of a reflection of Cosette, maybe you know, and he's high and he's with this dog, and he's, he's feeding the dog. The dog's a little mangy, looks hungry. Uh, you know, the lights, visually, it looks great. The lights from the He's feast. forgetting his problems. Adriana, now the new wife, and having a house, and being a mobster, and getting sober and not sober, and he just wants to fucking check out of all of it. That's what he does here. Um, it's I like very- to check out a lot of times right in the middle of this fucking podcast. <laughs> like right now, I like to go fucking check out. I think it's going pretty well. Yeah. Uh, the festival morning... Paulie sits in the car. They bring out St. Elzea statue. Uh, where's the gold hat? They want to know where the hat is. Mrs. Conti, who we saw in the last yeah. episode, who cursed the blue streak, she wants to know where the hat This is a big deal that they don't have the hat. Paulie's yeah. kind of surprised that anyone's even noticing, but it's a big deal. Uh, the guy, this is my nephew, George, just back from Iraq. I'm proud of you, my friend. Paulie's sitting there. Uh, the crowd does not like it that there's no hat. Doesn't like it. Paulie like Shaw changed him. Uh, Soprano Kitchen. Tony and Carmella at the kitchen table. Tony's in the refrigerator looking for things. 
I do that all the time. You I, don't do that. Skinny guys don't do that, do uh, they? We, we, yeah, I do. But she, I think this this little exchange, in a way, sums up the whole fucking show. This episode, and maybe the whole series in a weird way. He's looking in the fridge. He's got a, a, a fr- refrigerator full of food in this great house that's worth a million dollars or whatever. And his wife says to him, what do you need? And he says, I don't know. Very existential yes, moment, absolutely. very reflective of the themes of this episode and the show in general. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Boredom. And he's out of boredom. He's looking for food. He doesn't even know if he's hungry or not. Like Christopher uses drugs. They rob the wine. This boredom really is rearing its its head in this in this episode. You know, they sit down. You see the bottle of wine uh, on the counter. She says, I've been debating all night whether to even uh, say anything about this. I ran into Liz LaServa at the feast. She got it in her head that Christopher killed Adriana. What? That's insane. Now, Tony lies like he breathes. Like he breathes. I mean, you know, uh, even so much that he lied about, of course, he lied about his ankle and said that he fell at the pork store right. off the riser, the and they, they fixed, fixed it. The banister. He lies like he breathes. I mean, it, it comes that easy to him. Yeah. I love, though, when, when she says, I've been debating whether to say this, and he rolls his eyes. It's like, there's always some. Yeah. In his what life is, is oh, what is it now? He, he played it really well. Uh, does that make him OJ? He's been, fr- has a history of being free with his hands. We know he's hit Carmella before. I mean, he's hit. Adriana before Christopher has. That's my point. Now he comes with a whole big bullshit thing. Uh, if I really thought he did it, how fast do you think they'll haul his ass in jail? Right. If the feds were talking and asking questions, how quick would they get him? And he says, you know, with the fibers, the cops say that now he's an expert on domestic violence because right. Uncle Junior shot him. Nine so times out of ten. It's done in the bedroom or in the kitchen. And there's always a body. You know, so it's just bullshit on top of bullshit on top of bullshit. And I'm not convinced that she uh, believes believes him. She wants to believe him really bad. He's saying Christopher's better now. He's focused. He also says he dumped Adriana now. And she goes, wait, I thought Adriana dumped him. You know, that was a big, that's a big red flag there. Uh, And yes, he does say he's doing great. He's focused. He's not sabotaging, which is all bullshit. And uh, he's wearing another one of those great Nat Nash shirts that uh, you don't see them around. Christopher doesn't wear those no. the Nat Nash shirts, you know. Uh, Dr. Sapola calls Paulie at the feast. Uh, now, Paulie, somewhere along the line, calls himself Peter when he calls in. That's his real name, I think. Peter Galtieri. Peter Paul Galtieri. Like Paul, uh, Tony Sirico's real name is Gennaro. Gennaro Anthony. Yeah. Yeah. G-A-S, his initials, gas. Uh, Dr. Sabola, I received the results of your PSA test. Not to worry, but the numbers are a little higher than I prefer. I'd like to go ahead, schedule a biopsy. He mentions cancer. He mentions biopsy. And that's all Paulie needs to go. But not only Paulie, anybody. Crazy. Anybody. He mentions cancer. Do you have a history of cancer in your family? Right away. It's like uh, George Costanza. Same thing there. Right. You know, you hear that. He says, I don't know. I don't know the history of my family because he, he doesn't know who know his know father, his father, father. Is. Uh, Of course, uh, Janice, Dominica, the baby, and, and Bobby Jr. go on a ride. Uh Janice, to, to, to Bobby Jr. wants to go on the big kid's ride. She she says, your, your younger sister wants you there. She's a pain in the her. ass. Yeah, she's away there, but in a way, he's a pain in the ass, the kid. And she's not letting him get away with it. She tells him, wipe that fucking puss off your face. Maybe you need a little more tough love these days instead of letting the kid get away with every fucking thing. Why, to put that big kid on that little kitty ride? But what? He's waving at the kid. She's asking him for 10 minutes. Wait till your father gets back. Uh, she's very demanding. Well, she, look, she's a nut job. Yeah, she but, is. But <laughs> these kids could be spoiled, and sometimes they need to be straightened out. Yeah, I agree. And a lot of the parents today refuse to do that. They're I was never of one of those kids. parents. They're afraid of their kids. 
I'm not afraid of I like when my mother used to say that. Wipe that puss off your face. Yeah, so did so did. You don't hear that much anymore. Puss. Where does that come from? Uh, the, the puss, you know. Yeah, but what? Where does that word, the uh, etymology of it? I'm curious. Is it an Italian thing? I don't even know what etymology means. It means the history of the word. What puss? History I don't know. Word, Slapping right. the puss? Study of the word. Evolution of the word. Yeah. And what I'm saying is puss in Itali- like an Italian. I don't think it's an like, Italian thing. They say ponds, stomach, bonds. Yeah, little, I, little, I don't think know, it's whatever. an Italian thing. I don't I'm know, curious. Andy. Ex Andy. You said Andy knows everything. He knows everything. He fucking knows everything. Uh, so so the ride jerks forward. You see the sparks. Kid gets hurt. He's bleeding. The young kid is bleeding. She starts screaming. She's the ultimate drama queen. The ultimate drama queen. You know. Uh, so, of course, it's bad, but she makes it. A lot worse. Bobby, Sophia, rush up. Paulie's apartment calls a little. Paulie calls him. Listen, there's a problem with the ride. The teacups, the the things jammed up. People got hurt. The lady broke her wrist. Talking to where's the owner? He's talking to the cops. Fuck it. What do you want from me? Paulie don't want nothing to do with this. A kid broke his seat. What am I, a fucking dentist? Dentist. I got to be up in the morning. I got my fucking biopsy. So. You know, that's going to be the excuse for everything now. The biopsy. Yeah, you know that. You know. Uh, Soprano dining room. Sopranos, Bacaliris, Christopher Kelly are eating. Uh, then here goes Janet, starting with her bullshit. One second, you're sitting there enjoying a ride with your family. The next, your entire world comes crashing down. Tony's warning her. That's enough. Let it go. Let it go. Uh... Bobby says, scumbag Hilly, I should have kicked his ass. And she, she says, says, you yeah. did nothing. You know, what did you do? Nothing. It's very awkward. Everyone's kind of looking at him. He did nothing. It's kind of a little awkward there. There's a the tense moment. Mr. Yeah, he's a wise guy and he's got to do something. Then another another thing about this boredom and stuff. Tony says, uh, how's this wine? This wine is great. And Tony says, I feel like it's it's lost some of its pop. Well, it's the same wine. It's just... When they first had it, it was such a fun time. But I, I was thinking, he was saying a double entendre, like, it lost some of his pop. We popped that guy. Yeah, though that's what I'm saying. It's like he had, you know, in the con. It's like when you, when you, uh, when you're in a good mood and when we, with people you like and you have a dinner, like everything's better. The wine's yeah, course, better, the food. Course. That's and then you can, and then you go there on another night with somebody. And, eh, you have the same food. You have the yeah. same drinks, and it's not yeah. as good. She uh, she's egging Bobby on. It's very awkward. Uh, you know, uh, Meadow says, you know, they are entitled. She's forever becoming the lawyer. Uh, he says they're all going to sue. They're going to sue, and blah blah blah. And then the next scene, you see Janice. She has a neck brace. A neck on. brace on. Uh, Plus, me, uh, Andy says, "Puss," meaning the face, is a slang term from the 1880s. It's derived from the Irish term "puss," meaning the lips and mouth. There you go. Andy See, is, he is amazing. He's there amazing. Thanks, Andy. I knew you would find. He's out. like one of those. You know, you shake the eight ball, you ask him a question. No, it's incredible. That's why I said uh, the etymology, it's Irish. I thought it might have been Italian. I knew it was probably a New York kind of He thing. knows every... If he knows so much, why the fuck did he get involved with this podcast? Well, he on missed- paper, it looked good on paper. <laughs> <laughs> like a, mo- a lot of things. <laughs> motel room, Bobby arrives at the hotel. He pulls up, Janice is in the neck breaks... Uh, Bobby goes to Dale's room. Brutal, now, nasty. Bobby gets really brutal here. Nasty. Uh, Bobby could be nasty, but before this, we took pictures with the baby. You know, they're, they're twins, obviously, uh, and we took a whole lot of pictures in that crappy motel room. Uh, me, I either at why the baby. for like family pictures to have on the set and stuff like that. Yeah, on the set, promo shots, a ton of them. To even change yeah. our clothes, and it was in it was one a of shitty them, hotel. Shitty hotel. Uh, you, you redneck fuck. The baby was uh, on that ride with my wife. Uh, he wants twenty five grand, and he Bottom says money. he admits uh, to Paulie uh, he wouldn't hire the the good crew. I sent it to Atlanta. He hired the B crew. Uh, he cheaped out and it paid. And he also he knew that the the play, the equipment wasn't in good condition, and he had he wouldn't hire the repair crew. 
It's Paulie's fault, and Bobby is livid. Livid. Got all the eating contests, Paulie, Patsy, Jason, little Paulie, they're hanging around. Now, have you done a con any of those, ever do competitive eating? I hosted a grape eating contest once. Great. My son, won, when he was 12, won a corn eating contest in Detroit. And, would, and he, he was 12, and he was in the contest against grown adults. Corn eating? Corn. Corn on the corn cob? On the cob. You know how he did what he did to win? Uh, he, so corn is, uh, you know, long, you know, like this. Everyone's going like this. And he, he went, went like this. He went like this. Ah. He how went, many, he how many it, years he of corn? It, um, vertically. Right. How many he years of corn? Just, just one, but it was timed, and he won the contest because he, ah. he turned it up and down instead of sideways. And what did he win? I think money. Wow. Pipeline by one of my all-time favorite music heroes, Johnny Thunders, is playing. That's a cover of the uh, Shantae's hit from the 60s, but Johnny was... Now, we did this scene about a dozen times. One least. of your best scenes, one of the best, some of the best work you ever did. You really, you really nailed it here. The rage and the unhinged quality, and it's, it's very real, and I have to say... Thank you. One of Thank the best, you. one of the best, stuff. you know, great, great, great scene. One of Thank the best you. stuff I've ever seen you do. Really good. You work. know, uh, you know, so we got to come after Paulie and, you know, it's a dozen times. So after a while, you know, you may start losing that intensity a little bit. But I just kept thinking about Tony, who, you know, I was very close friends with as you are. But Tony could get under your skin at times. Yeah. He insulted you without, I don't even know if he meant it. He would just say a lot of shit. He just all the didn't time. care. <laughs> didn't care. And I just he kept thinking it. about times when he got me, made me mad. And I just kept thinking about it coming after him. And he went, hey, 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 slow down a little, he said to me, for two reasons. One, did he really think I was never going to break through and get him? And hit him, no. And then number two, he doesn't want Paulie to look bad. But that's what this that's scene, scene was all about. Paulie looks bad. Paulie did a bad thing. But Tony. Wants to protect Paulie. You know, Tony was like an old time, like John Wayne would never do this. Or, you know, this actor would never show weakness to right. his character. John That's, Wayne would never wear a dress. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, but you know what I'm saying. There's certain things, right? And these kind of tough guy actors, they would never let the audience see them in this light, like bogey and stuff, right? And Tony came from that. So, uh... You know, they held me back, and I just kept getting madder and madder and madder. And Tony don't back down. When I say my wife's got no damage, fuck her too. He's talking about the boss's sister. I right. mean, Paulie's out of line here. Uh, you don't script on safety. And he's saying, mind your business, Bobby. And the crowd, when Bobby walks away, they look at Paulie in disgust. Yeah. Great scene. Good job. They uh, uh, they look at him in disgust. The crowd is very down on Paulie Walnuts here. Melfi's office. I was at the feast. She's Italian. Every uh, Italian-American has been to an Italian feast. Uh, people, uh, Tony says there are thousands of people eating or praying. My sister was on the uh, ride with my niece when I lurched forward. He makes a couple jokes about God, St. Elzir. He's talking about snapped. people pay money, I almost puke, they scream and yell. And she says, why? Why do they do, think you do that? Because they're bored. Are you bored? Great line right here. Again, really emblem, a, a theme of the show, of the whole series. Every day is a gift, but does it have to be a pair of socks? Yeah. Uh, do you like rights? You know, um... I like the, I don't, you know, I don't like those roller roller coasters and shit. That's not my thing. It never was really. You? No, nah, I mean, I've I like done like it. the haunted house. Like I've that. done it, but I don't. I'm not. I'm not a ride guy. I mean, I've gone on the cyclone. Everybody from Brooklyn. Has, yeah, but, I've been on. The you cyclone. know, I'm not big with that uh, Disneyland and all that shit. You know, the haunted mansion was good. You That's know, fun. The, when I took the kids, I mean, when I was single, we went. I don't. I don't know if I'll ever go to Disneyland again. Yeah, I don't know. You know. The grandkids, man. You're going to have to take your grandkids. It's a lot of work. A lot of work. Uh, Paulie calls the doctor's office. This is where he says it's 
Oh, they, I, this line too. I guess it's a human condition. And she says, what is? And he says, I don't know. I got to tell you something. Lorraine doesn't even, doesn't even answer. She just stares at him. And it's just fantastic. Fantastic. Her yeah. silence is just fantastic. Really well written scenes. The look yeah. on her face, just letting yeah. him kind of hang himself and just, all right, you tell me. You know? Yeah, it's great. Uh, Paulie calls the doctor's office. He said, it's Peter. I'm calling for the results of my biopsy. I'm sorry, sir, they're still not in. You have to call back tomorrow. That's another thing now. You know, doctors could get the results sometimes a little faster. Something like this, where it's where you, you know, it could be cancerous. Like it could be a little bit more compassionate, and a lot yeah. of times they just fucking string you along. Well, not they, our know, doctor, not Doctor Massey. No, Very not the Doctor Dirtsman or Doctor Massey or Doctor Doctor uh, Rock. Doctor Rock is the, the best. Doctor Lazaro. Doctor Lazaro. We've got uh, good doctors. A Doctor Levy, you know, gets on the phone. You could get him on the cell phone. But they let you hang. They know you're fucking That's not busted cool. inside. Yeah. Even if you say, "Listen, uh, text. Hey, I didn't get it. I didn't hear anything yet. I will as soon as I hear." It's all I gotta. It's all you gotta do. Uh, Paulie Walnuts. He says, "Don't <laughs> touch the lemon with your fingers." The germaphobe, which Tony we know was Tony had hand sanitizer way before yeah. anybody else did. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the cologne, which we talked about, and. Uh, I mean, Tony's hands were clean enough to go into surgery with, like at yeah. all times, pretty much. And he had, you know, he was weird about, uh, you know, personal bathroom stuff. And a hypochondria. Stuff like that. Stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So he had, I told the story. He, that one year, he took nine doctors and their wives to the premiere. Nine doctors. And he wasn't really that sick. He's, he's strong like a fucking bull. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Even... Even well into his 60s, 70s, he'd knock a guy out. You kidding me? Absolutely. Like a bull. A tough guy, a real tough guy. And here no. he gets confronted by his aunt who raised him. And who was great. She is so good. Frances, she was great. Just so he good. He says, you so got to say a novena. These poor children. You made St. Elzia go without his hat. You cursed your mother, who was a blessed nun. And he says she was a fake like you were. Fuck the two of you. And now he's going to start thinking, maybe this is why I'm going to get cancer because he I've says, done fuck that voodoo. And, uh, and she says, uh, I'm here with the, you know, with the home, you know, like one of their outings. Now, I always she thought. She was at Green Grove, right? Yes. And I always thought uh, Barone's kid, when he said, I want 4000 a month. Right. Every month, and if you tell Tony, remember? And that money was going to go towards Green Girl. That's what I thought. But here she's saying they're being very kind. They tr your brother's trying to work out an arrangement. Because he took, he stopped paying. Yeah, but right. I thought he was going to use that 4000 to still pay for her. I was mistaken. He, and he says, oh, you're still over there. He's had no contact he's, with her. He's done with her. He stopped yeah. paying. He doesn't give a shit what happens to her. It's a really good scene. Uh Christopher's bachelor party, you know, we're gathered here tonight for the bachelor party of already married men. Little Carmine always with a corny fucking joke. Uh, all the guys are there. Uh, Bobby Last sees... tension between Bobby and Paul. Bobby sees Paulie. He gets up and leaves. Uh, he He's makes a, a bad joke about... Rosemary. I'll eat her. <laughs> and... <laughs> and uh, Nobody laughs. Everyone are tired of Paulie. They've had enough. It's very awkward. Bathroom. He's washing up. Tony comes in. You're doing a heck of a job there, Brownie. You know this, what that refers to, right? About the Bush. Michael Brown, who was the head of FEMA during uh, uh, Katrina, Bush said that, and it became kind of a catchphrase on when someone's not doing a good job. Sarcastic. Catchphrase. What happened to the regular ride guy? The guy we used last year, uh, for he wanted to charge, I'm getting killed here, Tone. Tony says, if it doesn't work as a business, get rid of it. I, and now he comes with, I got a lot on my mind, the biopsy. Tony could only be so hard on him when, they, when he's talking about the cancer, right? And again, nine out, of time, nine out of ten times, which he said to Carmelo, it comes out clean. I don't know, I'm having headaches. Uh... 
you know, might uh, metastasize, he says. And, 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 and Tony's like, you and your psychics and your dream messages and your dirty toilet seats. <laughs> you got to stop. And then he says, negative thinking. Negative thinking to, to, contribute to these. Well, things. Tony talks him off the ledge here, you know. Yeah. Uh, and But for a minute, Paulie snaps on him. Not for nothing, but a lot of this money goes in your pocket. Right. Because he's got to kick up to him. You know, everybody, every time somebody buys a sausage sandwich, Tony's got money going into his pocket. Right. Right? One way or another. Soprano basement. Uh, Tony puts the wine on the shelves. Christopher arrives. I sold mine. 300 for the five cases. Five dollars a bottle. Yeah. He got, he just dumped it for nothing. He calls Tony the bad lieutenant, obviously referring to one of my favorite movies by Abel Ferrar starring Harvey Keitel. Uh, that has a little bit of resonance here on some, a few levels. This is a movie about, you know, drug addiction and a junkie. Uh, I'm going to point out another connection to bad lieutenant in, in a later scene. Uh, Jim Gandolfini would have made a good bad lieutenant. That would have been a good role for him. They did a remake with Nicolas Cage that Werner yeah. Herzog did. Werner Herzog, you know, the bullshit artist. He's a bullshitter. Horrible movie. But Just I told you it was a movie. bullshit. The first one's a... genius. Yeah. I Yeah, you told me about that. I told you. You I auditioned did... for Bad Lieutenant, right? Correct. Correct. He told me. And he, he was... said you're in it. You're very jubilant to have you in my movie. We shook hands. I was at the Giraffe Hotel on Park Avenue. We were shooting Hungry Ghosts at the time. You let me out early. I went over there. I think I called you. I said, this guy said he was jubilant to have me in his movie. It's the role of a bookmaker. In another day, it was down to four of us. Then three of us. Then two of us. And guess what? I didn't fucking get it. But he said you had it. He said I had it. And he who got that role? You remember? I, I really don't know. I know he not, I remember it was not somebody. I know he bullshitted yeah. me in show business. Believe that. Show Could business. you believe that? The guy lied to me, the director. Could you believe that? It's hard to fucking believe. Uh, he says, uh, I put the he had the heater fix in the Bloomfield wire room. And Chris and Tony's like, oh, good. Yeah, that's good. Again, here we're talking about the boredom. Last time, the stakes were so high. It was so exciting with the robbery so, and stealing the wine. And now they're back to, they start to reenact it, reminisce about it. And it's just not, it's very doesn't awkward. have the same pop. It's very awkward. Yeah. Very, very it's awkward. It's like yesterday's laughter and they can't really get to it. Well, it wasn't, uh, it's, I don't know if it's coming up. Remember when is the, uh, what is, what's the line? Remember when is the least. Lowest uh, form of conversation. Lowest form of conversation. Yeah. But you get those guys always talking about, you know, remember when we did this, remember yeah. when we did that. Hate remember it. when we did this, remember that. Uh, Paulie's apartment, Paulie calls the doctor's office. Uh, it's 3 a.m. 3 o'clock. Are you going to tell the people what 3 o'clock no. is? Dr. Sapolo. Are you going to tell? Is it in the book? Are you going to give that up? I'm not going to say about the book. They got to get the book to figure it out. Wow. Okay, fucking harsh. I'm harsh. You don't want to give that 3 a.m. up? No, that means. no, no, no. Uh, Dr. Cipolla, it's an, is it an emergency? Yeah, it's an emergency. Well, Dr. Palieri's there. Palieri means straw shoes. You know that? Like no. a scarecrow or something like that. Now, I have to point out in this scene, Paulie Walnuts, the hair is so interesting and so out of character. I think we need the wing of meter. The wing of meter. Yeah. We haven't had it in months and months, months. and months. We need to we need the wing of meter to determine how serious this hair is. This yes. wing game is off the charts. This Let's wing take game a look. is pretty amazing. There Let's you go. Wow. Wow. What is that? That's a four. Wow. We've got a four. We That's a four, four. wing meter for sure. Oh. 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 Hey. I tell you what, if it was a six on there, this would be a six. Yeah, this this is a... We this haven't is the dusted. wings in all their glory on display in this scene. We tonight. had to dust off the wing meter We had to dust it off and take it out of the closet. And uh, it came through once again. Yes, it did. Paulie's wings are off the chart. Uh, bought a big back room. Paulie arrives. Uh, Tony, I told him he got to meet Eddie Lynn, pick up uh, some money. 
Uh, he sees a vision of the Virgin Mary statue. This refers to Bad Lieutenant. There's a scene in Bad Lieutenant when he has a vi he sees Christ, and it's very it's very similar in its effect. Did Abel Ferrara write it also? It was actually written by. There's a scene in the movie with this woman who's a junkie, and she's shooting up Harvey Keitel. That was Zoe Lund. She was once known as Zoe, Zoe Tamerless in the movie Ms. Forty Five. She's the star of that movie. She was very young, I think, a teenager. Ms. Forty Five. She was a poet and a writer. She wrote the original Bad Lieutenant script, brought it to Abel. He collaborated with her on the script. She died not long after the Bad Lieutenant, but she was a very interesting poet and writer, Zoe Lund, and a, and a really good actor. Um, interesting little moment here. Now, he sees the vision. It was 3 o'clock. Remember Pagano in the first scene on the reality sign, reality, uh, realty sign. Now he goes to answer the door for Eddie Lind, and when he opens the door, there's a, a neon Budweiser with a shamrock. Remember, hell is an Irish bar, ba, 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 that stuff. The line you wrote. Interesting. Shamrock, neon. Now, the use, this is a definite, not a coincidence. I don't think so. You never asked? Did you ever ask no, Terry no. Winter? No, because I wasn't, uh, I didn't write this episode. I wasn't producing it or anything, but no. But I, th I think it's a fascinating detail. Carmela, Tony, Bobby, and Janice Walk. The Last day of the feast. Uh, then he says, next week, you say next week, uh, the week after next, St. Anthony. So kind of like life goes on, a moment of excitement and pleasure over. And then it goes back to the boredom. And then again, we're going to have another feast. That's kind of like life in general, right? That's kind of the point they're making. Uh, Dominica is crying. Bobby she wants excitement like everybody, I think. She misses that ride, even though she got hurt. The, the regularness of life is almost not, you know, she, she got a taste of excitement and she wants it. Even the baby understands that. Tony uh, picks her up over his head. He's twirling her around. His kids love it. Uh, a very nice scene. Jan Janice is a, uh, she is a pain in the ass. She's all over Bobby's ass. She's God cool. damn it. You God. don't get it. Don't, Bobby don't get a break. No. Uh, Nucci's room. Great scene. I She's love the watching end of TV. this episode. She's watching Lawrence Welk. Lawrence Welk was on TV for 31 years, from 1951 to 1982. He was born, this is interesting, 1903 in Strasbourg, North Dakota, in a German community, and didn't learn English till he was 21. Left the farm at 21 to pursue music. So he was born in the United States? In a German community in North Dakota in 1903, and didn't wow. learn to speak English till, till for 20 till he was 20. He was a, a very beloved, beloved, beloved accordion guy. player, band leader. Yeah. Many families sat and watched. Uh, that was appointment TV back then. Yeah, uh, Ed Sullivan show, Lawrence Welk show, appointment TV. Paulie needs his mother. Uh, everyone's down on him. He's afraid he's got cancer. She opens the door. Paulie, I don't want to argue. What are you watching? Very comes, docile, very sad. Comes You're, to make peace. He doesn't apologize or say anything, but his presence is, you know, enough. She asks him if he wants cookies. It's a very nice moment. Between cut to the outside with the trees, again, the wind. Again, we've seen that, that in The Sopranos again and again about, I mean, sometimes it's about death. He, you know, that saying Tony had on the bulletin board in the hospital, uh, you I go go about pity for yourselves. Yourself. Meanwhile, a great wind propels you across the sky. Maybe that's referring to that. Life goes on. Fragility of life. Go back to that song, Pipeline. We end with Johnny Thunders, the great Johnny Thunders. Very nice scene. A very nice episode. Tony Sirico was great in it. Some really good stuff. Yeah. Really good stuff. I love that episode. It's great. Really well done. And this is episode, uh, that was episode 75, right? Yeah, that was season oh, that's six 76. episode, uh, uh, season six, episode nine. So we have three left in season six, and then we go into the back nine, my friend. 12 left. 12 wow. left. Wow. Wow, wow, Will wow. we make it? Stay tuned, folks. Will uh, we make it to the finish line? We're getting close. Will the wheels fall off? <laughs> They fell off, brother. 
<laughs> now it's time for the Torah Sopranos Ask Me Anything segment. The winner of our Ask Me Anything best question is Franco from Brooklyn, New York. And we're sending Franco a pair of Bose headphones. Franco asks, what episode do you believe was your character's most important in terms of story and development? You want to go first? You want me to go first? I think, uh, I think you finally, I think it's called another two pick, is it? Burt Young episode. Burt Young episode. I think that's the one with Bobby. You know, you've seen him around, dabbling around, you know, uh, you don't see much of him. Suddenly you see that he's got a father. He's do doing more than just taking care of Junior. And uh, you see that there's more to this guy. Yeah. And I think uh, very much that's the first time you see him. I think later on, after he connects with Janice, I think you see Bobby becomes a pretty good businessman. And maybe not as dumb as everyone thinks. You know, he does marry the boss's sister. Suddenly on Sundays, he's sitting to the right hand of the Well, who said he was dumb? Family. Whoever said Bobby was dumb? Well, I mean, he was kind of dumb early on. He did a lot of kind of stupid things and with Junior. And, and, and he wasn't the brightest guy. He was very obvious, you know. Uh, but then later on, I think you see him coming around. And he's told by Tony, every man's got to, you know, fend for themselves and does that happen in another know. toothpick when tony says that tony says that to him no 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 that's, that's a different all episode. later on i just think you see bobby for the more t first time more than just kind of shrug his shoulders and is the puncher bag for junior and getting yelled at suddenly i think you see bobby uh in that you know? episode was karen still alive in that episode uh karen was still alive in that episode yeah karen dies later on season four you know. Now, what would it, what would have happened to Bobby if Karen didn't die? He just would have been just another one of the, the same guys. thing. Yeah, you know that's what I'm saying. I think he just would have been just one of the guys. I mean, he, you know, he. They said he never had a gomada. He was raising his kids, uh, and then he connects with this crazy Janice who manipulates him. He was looking for somebody to help him with his kids, and. He's now married to the boss's sister. Yeah, smart move. Not so bad. He doesn't know that she killed Richie, don't forget. He doesn't know that, right, because that was before they were together, obviously. And also... He doesn't know a lot. He finds it, out it, later. It puts you a little bit more in a place of safety as well, right? Of course, absolutely. I mean, Bobby now, like I said, every Sunday he's having dinner. He's uh, at the family barbecue. Although he, they killed it, Carlo in The Godfather. But, but Carlo set that up. Yeah, he did a Carlo, bad thing. Carlo uh, yeah. double-crossed him. Big time. You know, Carlo double-crossed him. So, What about you? Uh, you know, I'd say a really big one early in season one, The Legend of Tennessee Montesante. Um, both personally, too, because, I mean, I've said this before, but, you know, when I first we first started, listen, episode two, they brought on Brendan Falone. I thought they were bringing him on to replace me. He was better looking. He was, you know, a really good actor, and I knew his work and stuff like that. And I figured they would say that I was not what they wanted, and I thought he was really going to kind of replace me as the young protege of Tony or whatever the hell my function was. So I was kind of surprised any time my role got bigger. But that was probably episode eight of season one around, and. It, Christopher had a lot to do, and, and that was uh, that was character. the the ending when he buys the newspapers. Yeah, and it just established him really trying to be a writer, and him really aspiring to bigger things, and his excitement, and it just um, it it kind of it was character development in terms of his importance in the family and his importance on the show. Um, and that when I read that script, I was really kind of blown away. I never knew I was going to get episodes that big. You know, you don't really know. Well, you don't know, but also if, and this is a fact, you know, if you don't deliver the fucking goods, you're not getting another big one. Oh, 100%. Okay, so they give it to you. Especially on The Sopranos. You know, they're going to give it to you, and you had better deliver. You better do a good job. Yeah, and you've seen good. guys on The Sopranos and on other shows where they're given this 
chants this episode. And yes, there is a lot of pressure. Sure. It's a lot of pressure. So look, they're giving me this. I better, they, they gave me another toothpick. They gave me a father. I better deliver this. Yeah. This is not two lines where I shrug your tone. Yeah, Uncle June. Yeah. I'm in awe of you. You know, this is, they're giving you some meat on the bone and you better take care of it. Just like you did with Christopher. You better be prepared. You better make choices. You better know what the fuck you're doing. And I've seen actors, listen, sometimes when I started in, in, in film, I cracked under pressure just because I didn't, it was, the stakes were so high and I wasn't experienced and stuff. But then I've seen actors who are experienced and they sabotage, like they'll have a giant scene or three giant scenes in one day and they won't learn their lines. Well, of so course. they'll get to the fucking set and what could have been a virtuoso performance turns into like crap. I have a friend of mine didn't learn his lines was on a what well, was on a show on Showtime didn't learn his lines thought he could ad lib it three episodes down the road he comes in unprepared three episodes down the road he dies on the show. That was no coincidence. No coincidence. Yeah. It happens over and over again. Yeah, and I don't I don't know. I mean I don't know if it's it's just listen, it takes a lot of work to learn lines. At least for me it does. I know. Listen for you to me, I'm does. fucking i I've, I've been busting my ass. I got two heavy scenes two days in a row. It takes two, a lot of time. Four scenes. It's a lot of I'm not time. saying it's like heavy labor, but it takes a lot of time no. and you have to nail it down. A lot now, of time and a lot of time and, and it's frustrating. And frustrating. No, it's not digging ditches. No. Let's not kid ourselves. I'm not saying that, but and it we're is getting a lot of paid time for and you, it. And you have to you do know. your work. So I always wonder, were they just lazy and didn't want to do the work? Did they struggle with it? Because some people have, you know, uh, have dyslexia or whatever they have, and, and and sometimes that's hard. But often, more than anything, maybe it might be a form of sabotage. They're afraid. There's, you know, a thing called being afraid of success. I guess. I mean, you know, I hear you. I mean, I, I, I very much hear that. That happens in sports a lot. Yep. The, uh, yeah, you get the, the, the choke thing where yeah. You, you know, listen, it's not easy. I mean, and that, I think, separates good ball players from great ball players. Uh, there's guys that are this close to making it in the majors and don't make it. There's guys that were great college basketball players but couldn't cut it in the pros and so on. And I think it's the same thing with acting, you know. I mean, and it's not an easy thing to do. You got 150 people on the crew. All eyes are upon you. No, it's like, you know, playing music is also similar. You know, you could be in practice at home and then you're, or you're in the practice studio with the band and you're doing stuff and it's all really good. And then once you, now you go in front of an audience, you need to be, you know, it's almost like you need to be like 10 times as practiced to, because the tension sure. and the energy of, and the kind of nerves of being in front of a, 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 a club full of people is a whole other thing. So you got to put in, it's like learning your lines. You got to put in the time, you got to drill it and drill it and drill it. So it becomes, you feel confident. I've seen people <clears throat> time and time again, man, sabotage it. That's my, that's my nightmare. My nightmare is being on a set. And for some reason, you know, everything that you learn to put the time in and you're just fucking you know dries up on you and you're done and you can't remember anything and i've had that dream a couple of weeks ago it was a book i was performing like a book and i sh and i and i kept saying to myself you got to learn the book you got to learn the book and then i show up that they were going to do it on stage and i don't know it and i'm thinking i can wing it and they're like you can't wing this no. you don't even know what you're doing fucking horrible that's horrible that's that's a lot of actors nightmare especially in a play. I mean, I told you, I did Guys and Dolls on Broadway. It was two performances at Carnegie Hall with all these Tony Award winners. I, 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 I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep for nine fucking days. I was horrified. I'd never been so scared in my life. Yeah. Because it wasn't even like you're doing the play. Okay, I could blow the line now, right, in previews, and then it'll be okay because I'm going to get, you know, a hundred more chances. This was... You know, daytime, dress rehearsal, and that night at Carnegie Hall in front of 2,700 people. Fuck me. 
Man, I've never been so scared. Yeah, it's scary. It's terrifying. It's terrible, you know, terrible. And uh, and you got to put the you got to put the work in, man. You know, and that's uh, that's all there is to it. There. So thanks, Franco uh, from Brooklyn, for that Franco, question. Franco, thank you very much, and thanks for listening. Remember, new episodes are released every Monday, and we only got about a dozen left. Please subscribe to the Target Sopranos podcast, YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Like us on Facebook. Go to our website to find out where our live performances are taking place. Our book, November 2nd, woke up this morning. Uh, and you can get official Talking Sopranos merchandise on TalkingSopranos.com or through our YouTube channel. We, uh, Zopa's going to be in Seattle at the Freakout Festival. Uh, it's a music festival in Seattle. They have not, this is the ninth, uh, version of that. And that's, we're going to be there on, uh, November 12th and 13th. You know, uh, you can find, go to my Instagram, Real Michael Imperioli, and there's info and a link there. Our executive producer is Jeff Sussman. Producer's Andy Verderam. Our music was composed and performed by Elijah Amerton. You can hear more of Elijah's music and the band Zopa, which Elijah and I play in together by clicking the links at TalkingSopranos.com. Our production crew includes Ty Verderam and Sierra Sharippa. Talking Sopranos is a Pod Jams production. All right, man. See you later. Good episode.